to say that I'm unfortunately I'm going to leave after the first work session. As many of you know, I had elbow surgery last Thursday, and I'm in a fair bit of pain. Um, and uh, also on a cocktail of painkillers, which probably will make me even more incoherent than I normally am as the as the night goes on. So, um, but I do feel strongly about um, being here for that first discussion because I think it's an important issue and uh, a decision which has. Um, significant trade-offs. The three relatively minor issues I wanted to bring up is, one, to ask the city manager if we could trim the tree back that is um, blocking the light at the intersection of Maple and Philadelphia. So if you're traveling on Maple southbound, um, uh, the walk signal and the right-hand turn arrow are obscured by some leaves coming from the, the tree that's there in the corner of Philadelphia and Maple. Uh, it's on the other side of Philadelphia, so if you're traveling south on Maple, it's on the n s south uh, east corner of, of uh, that intersection. Um, the second is that on Maple, there's uh, a large speed bump. It's the last speed bump at the end of Maple, but it also acts as a crosswalk because there are handicap ramps at both ends of it, and it's um, needs to be repainted um, to make sure that people, A, see it, because people often speed down the hill and then come close to catching air, but also realize that it also functions as a crosswalk. And then the last m minor item is that um, the wonderful Bell Ziegler sign at Jackie Park uh, has been brought to my attention by one of our constituents that, uh, um, that the spacing on the letters is quite odd. So um, it's the wrought iron um, sign um, so that, uh, and I walked by it the other night. It does look sort of odd the way the, it presents because the letters don't have uniform spacing, basically. And I think it's a matter that can be rectified pretty easily. So if Public Works could look at that. The two more substantive issues are ones I want to get feedback from my council colleagues on. One is that there's been a lot of power outages in Tacoma Park over the last six months. Um, for a while, there was a circulated list keeping track of the power outages. I know, Colleen, in your ward, there was a, a lot of them. My ward has been hit um, very hard in the last month or so. And what I would propose is that I'm happy to do the legwork to go to the delegation, but wanted to see if I could go not just as myself, but as the, you know, representing the, the mayor and the council, to ask that the District 20 delegation um, uh, have a forum with PEPCO similar to the WSSC forum that we had a number of years ago, uh, or not a number of years ago, I guess maybe a year ago. And basically what we'd be asking PEPCO to do is to come and present publicly some information and answer questions um, like um, talking to us about uh, a map with the layout and age of the electrical, electrical infrastructure uh, in the city, um, the quality of that infrastructure, um, their plans for improving it. Um, uh, there's always this interest or question about we should bury the power lines, um, and that has significant cost implications. And so I think it would be good for the public to be able to uh, get some answers related to the power outages and, and the um, electrical infrastructure. They could also answer questions like, you know, why have there been so many power outages and what's the, how does that compare to other parts of the county or, or, the, or the state? So. If, if um, my council colleagues were um, uh, in support of that, I would reach out to the, the District 20 delegation. Um, PEPCO is, we don't really have a, any official authority over PEPCO, and the state is the one that regulates PEPCO. And uh, I suspect that the delegation would be happy to help us um, get PEPCO here and, um, and hold that forum. So if people are supportive of that idea, I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. Does anybody not think it's a good idea to do that? I'm, I'm particularly interested in that idea because uh, I believe there's a Pepco uh, substation right across uh, Maple Avenue, and there more than infrequently <laughs> <laughs> there are big pops and uh, browns, browns, brown circles, or brown, you know, as in less electricity in our houses, and uh, it, there's a bad fan in there, and there are a couple other things going on. Great. So, so it sounds like we yes. should do that. Okay. And then the second issue is, um, I was thinking about this after our discussion about the speed cameras last week. Um, and one of the parts of the speed camera law is that 
when the revenue from the speed cameras reach 10% um, of the total revenue for the city, you actually have to start giving that money back to the state. Um, it includes the speed camera revenue. So if our budget is, you know, our revenue is roughly 25 million, we could keep 2.5. If there was another 5 million from speed camera, you know, we might be able to keep 3 million. Um, but I find that sort of odd considering that the state is now doing a couple of things. One, suggesting that any sidewalks that are built in uh, along state highways in cities are a responsibility of the city and not state highway. And, and they've also, there's questions about whether they're, they're going to repave certain sections of, the, of uh, our roads. Um, so I'd be interested in having a conversation with the District 20 delegation again about seeing if we could um, uh, adjust that or make some amendments to that law to account for that that fact so that we could keep some additional speed camera money and use it for those specific purposes. Um, it also might be coupled with um, some stipulations about whether they actually give us highway user revenue or continue to cut it at a 90% level. 90% is the level last year, right, Bruce? Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, assuming, uh, you know, I just want to start the conversation with the District 20 delegation. I wanted to check in to see if people are okay with that. Prospect, um, as Bruce pointed out to us, the the deadline for when they have to have their legislation uh, in has been pushed back, I think, to October now. So we could have some conversations with them and actually be able to discuss it uh, publicly in, in September. So if people are supportive, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great, okay, thank you. <clears throat> and that was your third point, actually. So I guess the pills have sort of made you lose count. My third point. Yeah, you had the tree blocking it, then the District 20 delegation hold, holding a PEPCO forum, and the third one was the speed camera revenue. Oh, I had the two serious and the three minor. Ah, I see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Council yes. Member. The medication, I'm sure. <laughs> Council Member Clay. Um, okay. So I made some comments last week at the during the session about being fr frustrated about being the only woman on the council, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit more in my in my comments today. Um, I got an interesting email from the city manager afterwards asking if she, if she felt like I was, uh, uh, if, if anything the, the, like that she or the city staff were doing, you know, were, were uh, essentially uh, dissing me, and that's not actually the issue. So I'd spend a little more time thinking about it while I wasn't just really angry and in the moment. <laughs> um, and, you know, what I, what I find is that uh, ideas get, presented, and then, you know, they may or may not get traction then, and then they, they come back around again, and, and oftentimes I feel like they, they come back around again as somebody else's idea, and, and they do get traction, which frustrates me, and the press picks it up then as, the, as delivered by the new person, and being the only woman on the council, whenever I have an idea that that happens to, it's always a guy then who, who, who gets the... Uh, gets the interest in the and the, the other person is a guy. It, yeah, that's right, and then the press. Um, but it's sort of this bigger issue that we've we've talked about uh, over the five years that I've been on the council, which mm -hmm. is about um, tracking requests and people's right. activities. And um, so it, it kind of makes the point that that is not it's not happening in an effective manner. So. Uh, for example, uh, two weeks ago, Councilmember Wright was talking about his issues with the uh, arborist tree regulations, and one of the things he talked about was something that I had brought up before, which is being able to um, get credit for planting a tree before a tree that you know is at the end of its life dies. Um, and I, I think just for efficiency's sake, we should come back and, and just to do better service to the community, we should come back and revisit that issue because while it frustrates me on that sort of smaller level, on the bigger level, we're sort of repeatedly bringing up issues and we're not, um, we're not having a mechanism to track them when we don't have an immediate resolution. And we don't have a council staff like the county council members do whose job it is to do that for us 
Um, and, and so I guess what I'd, I'd like us to do is come back around and, and talk about that again and find a way to, to do that. I know um, I didn't go to the Ocean City Conference this year, but used to go to the Ocean City Conference and they would have all this software that was going to track that. And then we have the My, My Tacoma Park uh, software, but it doesn't really track things by ward. We can't break it out and report back to people. And so um, I would like to revisit that issue. It would be less frustrating for me. Um, and I think would help us do things better than we do them now. And there's not, I think a lot of things come up in council comments, like a lot of new ideas come up here, and they, I mean, maybe they get traction or not, which is fine, but we should have some things that we can execute, some things that go to a, a longer term parking lot, but I think we should have some plan for what to, what to do with those. Um, and I think it even happens on a smaller level on emails. So, for example, last week we got an email from the city staff about the rec programs being full. And I replied to that and said, hey, that's great. What are the numbers for the whole summer and not for just this one week? But I haven't seen anything on that. And so I have to... Um, you know, I have to figure out how to, to monitor that, and I, and I do okay with it when I don't have a ton of things going on. I, I look back through my emails and see what I haven't answered or not. Um, if I end up like this summer where, you know, the last eight weeks I've been on four weeks of travel and a week of vacation, there's some breaks in there and it makes it harder. But then we're also having the issue where we're, all, we're asking different questions. So, like, we've got – there are power outages in Ward 2, and I've got people in Ward 2 who are – addressing this issue, and Ward 1 has folks, and Ward 3 has folks, but we don't always coordinate across those things. And so, for example, this week I got calls from people because Sligo Creek Parkway was not closed by the police on Sunday and apparently created da a dangerous s situation. And I don't know how many of the rest of you. It was closed late, I think. It was, it was closed late? It just, it just it wasn't, wasn't closed. closed. Yeah, I, I was told it wasn't closed, but... I wasn't out there, so in any case, I think we should revisit the issue of right. tracking people's things that they want to see happen, tracking people's issues that they have come up, tracking requests for information and coordinating across those groups. And I can do some of that, but I, like, I, can't, I can't do all of it. I would absolutely support your request for that discussion, and I would also ask the media to report that this was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree that in two weeks I'll bring it up again and then I'll get traction. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> and uh, let me let me also just say that uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that uh, I've been doing is as things like this come up, I do make note of them on my agenda and uh, we kind of put those on to a uh, – uh, rolling the rolling agenda for things to come up uh, in my weekly meeting with the city clerk and the city manager, but it's it's an imperfect system. So you know, I I have been doing some of those, but I wouldn't claim that I've got them all. Right. That's so what I said, to the city manager. I'm like, it's not about you or the staff or any of the individuals. It's like it's a bigger mm -hmm. structural issue that we need to address. Yeah. And so I, I put your topic on my list. <laughs> um, in response, go ahead. would it help to, uh, for that list, such as it is, to be uh, put out on email to Circulation. all of yeah. us? Uh, sure. Not that often, but once in a while. Mm -hmm. we, we proposed doing that. It just as one of those things that didn't get done. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things we do at work when we do that is we use the Blackboard or some of those like joint communication Google places. Docs. What's it called? Google Docs. You can also use. Google, Google I haven't Google done Docs. that one. Yeah, it's really handy. But where we could share the information. And I'll put another column about who gets press coverage for what. <laughs> <laughs> that column will, just, column that, that column will just be Councilmember Clay gets the press coverage. <laughs> It, it might require you to use your Tacoma Park email, however. Is that okay? Might Tacoma when it works. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Councilmember Robinson, did you have something? Okay. Councilmember Wright. Uh, I know this wasn't Colleen's main point, but there have been a number of issues that Colleen has been the idea generator, and I have brought up at later points, and I usually try and credit her with those um, suggestions, but uh, I know there's sometimes where I have forgotten to or it hasn't, uh, I've forgotten that she's been the original originator of the idea, um, and just want to say that, you know, they are her ideas, and I, and I think very <laughs> Highly of uh, Council Member Clay and is one of the great idea generators on the council. So, um, and I've just got a couple things to mention. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to get this acronym right. Council Member Siemens can help me. Maria, the Maple View apartment, re Maple View residents. What's the I? Improvement. Improvement Association was recently formed. That's the uh, building at 7710 Maple Avenue. And uh, those folks had a very nice uh, gathering on Saturday. And both Councilmember Siemens and I were there along with about, what, 60 people, something yeah. like that. And uh, they've taken it upon themselves to uh, get organized and get involved. and. Uh, They've been uh, concentrating on some things internally, and uh, we, there was also encouragement to uh, work on external links as well to uh, their neighbors on Maple Avenue, the rest of the city, the county, the Washington area, and uh, I think they have some real energy there and some real focus and look forward to their continued improved involvement. And that's a very good sign. Yes, I think uh, Christopher King and, and the other residents there at the, uh, at the building have done an excellent job in, in really organizing the people and, and getting them to uh, come together and get to know each other. And it sounds like they have a lot of, uh, as you said, energy to work on community issues. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to let folks know that at least currently, uh, as envisioned, the Tacoma Park, the new Tacoma Park Fire Station should be reopening in September. There's various people who are muttering August, but other people are saying there's no way it'll be September, and people are feeling like that might be an appropriate time since that would be the two-year mark since the, uh, since the old one was emptied and the project started. So uh, hopefully in September we will have the new fire station. Uh, and then the final thing I just wanted to mention was I went to the uh, Maryland Municipal League board retreat uh, over a couple days, uh, the end of last week, and uh, one of the things that we voted on was to uh, pull some money from reserves and establish a uh, public relations campaign, hire some uh, consultants uh, to make the Municipal League efforts more effective at getting state revenues back for municipalities, particularly highway user revenues, uh, realizing that there have been efforts in that direction for years, but we haven't been successful. And so a real pointed effort to uh, go hard at this with uh, some efforts toward the, uh, the first phase being aimed toward the uh, primaries and with possible uh, second and third phases for the uh, general election in November, and then the legislative session in January. And uh, so that's going forward, and uh, I was asked today to be part of the Oversight Committee to oversee that public relations effort, so I'm one of four people in the state who will be doing that. So if anybody has any ideas or uh, any reactions to anything you see going forward, uh, I'm probably going to be involved in uh, weekly meetings or conference calls overseeing that effort. Anybody else have any comments? All right, then we'll move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is just a brief scheduling update, just to note that uh, the tentative discussion that we had originally scheduled uh, for this evening that was partnering with the uh, the last item on our uh, agenda this evening, discussion of youth appointments to committees. I had originally paired uh, the discussion of vending in city facilities, but we decided we would move that to next week. So that will be July 26th. So, I'm sorry, which one is being moved? The vending facilities. Uh, and then after next week, 
we will be on our uh, summer recess for the month of August, and we will return on the day after Labor Day, which is Tuesday, September 7th. So we have tonight's meeting and one next week, and then we're off. Uh, the next item is adoption of minutes. We have before us uh, minutes from March 15th, March 22nd, and April 5th. Would somebody like to move their adoption? Move second. Moved by Councilmember Seaman, seconded by Councilmember Snipper. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, the next agenda item is public comment period for anybody who'd like to uh, come to the podium and uh, share your thoughts on any and everything. And please identify yourself and keep your comments to three minutes. And I see, and I see Mr. Loveless in the back getting wireless one. Yep, my name's Pat Loveless, 7620 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park, Maryland, your official peace delegate. I also, I want to ask you a question about, I brought this up before, about having a call-in system for call-ins uh, who uh, can't make it to meetings or something, because I would have uh, appreciated that last week when they discussed the alcoholic beverage uh, law, because I couldn't make it to the meeting because I was sick and I, and I couldn't make it, and I wanted to... Uh, put an input on that, and that would have been very valuable for people who couldn't make that meeting. Because uh, I see the alcoholic beverage law is a, is a big problem for the city. It's going to increase crime. We're trying to keep gangs off the street. We're trying to keep our, our youth uh, interested in uh, safe alternatives to uh, drugs and alcohol. And we're about to uh, make, make a decision that could uh, it's going to affect all that. And I'd like to see us uh, make a good educated, responsible adult decision by looking at the past on other areas. Look at TikTok. Look at the places where the gangs hang out on the streets. Look at the, look at the problems we have in D.C. So if we can uh, stop the off-site uh, off sales of beer and wine, that would be a good step to serving our youth in our city by not putting the temptation there where they can buy it and take it off the grounds. You know, and give it to kids. They, I mean, there's nothing to stop them from taking it off the grounds and giving it to, say, a 13-year-old about, about a half a block down the street. There's nothing to stop them from doing that. I mean, we know that. And I'd like to be able to, I'd like to see no off-sale sales of, of liquor, beer, or wine, or anything, because uh, that's, that's a kick in the teeth to our youth. The second thing I'd like to do is thank the Tacoma Park Police for coming over my, to my house when I needed him a couple of weeks ago when I got robbed. I was robbed of $180 in my apartment. And uh, the police were, came over here lickety-split, and I'd like to thank them very much on the quick uh, service I got. Because Tacoma Park is really doing good. Even though I, I knew I wasn't going to get the money back, we still have to let the people know that there is something like that going on. Third thing I'd like to do is uh, ask you people, while you guys are out, could you uh, encourage people to? Uh, could you encourage people to uh, get registered to vote while we're on this uh, recess? Because I think that'd be great if we could. Because uh, when you come back, kids will be starting school already, <laughs> and uh, a good way to start school now that they finished it, <laughs> restarting school again for people who are about to turn 18, would be great to get them to register to vote. You know, because again, like I said before, drinking beer and wine is something we're going to vote on here in the city council. And also, it's something they're going to vote on, if that, whichever way that law goes, whether they're going to drink or not. It's going to uh, affect them directly. And I'd like to see them, part of their ad adult passage into adulthood is to register to vote. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Anybody else? Which is the, the traffic 
If you speak with the state delegation about that, it strikes me, speaking just for myself, that this is a law that has a flaw in it and that it's set up a mechanism by which something would be funded that is a finite funding target. There's only so much money that can be spent on traffic calming and on improving the ADA accessibility of the, of the city. And yet the, the funding source is potentially infinite. Unless we naively believe that people are going to stop speeding at some point, this fund can continue to draw money and continue to draw revenue long past the point where the city has anything meaningful to spend the money on. And I, I have to confess a certain amount of ignorance about the details of this, but my understanding is that the city is quite limited in what it can spend the money on, and it has to spend the money on that if it gets this money at all. And I think we should be talking to the state about whether we might want to amend that law so there's a broader diversity, even if it's related to transportation, a much broader diversity of what that money can be spent on. Now that's actually, I think, been illustrated in this tranche of spending, and this is an early tranche. I don't know where you guys are going to go with uh, where the city will go with spending these funds in, ult in future years once we've uh, done what we're, we're doing this year. And what I want to talk about briefly this, in terms of this year, I live in North Tacoma, and this is where this process has gone on. The process has been very flawed. There's been no community engagement in a, in a decision-making process about how to change the sidewalks and the ramps of our neighborhood that affect the tree canopy of our neighborhood. Now, this is a tree city. It's one of the reasons I live here, because of the respect this city has for trees. It's one of the few municipalities that has a very strong, very strong pre tree protection plan and tree protection ordinance, and we've seen that come up in the council's business in the past few sessions. And yet there's a gap between what I have to do as a homeowner to protect my trees and what the city, in effect, can do to me to my trees without my permission and without getting my engagement. And to talk more about that, I'd like to ask if my wife could speak, Colleen Cordes. Thanks. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, I did a survey of the, we saw a strange, we saw um, a gentleman out marking up our sidewalks with chalk back, I think in May and asked him what he was doing. And basically he told us that, um, you know, the city had to speed, spend its speed camera money on sidewalk improvements, handicapped access. Actually, he said handicapped access. And that, and we began talking about how the trees he was marking up had just had a new access ramp placed in and expanded concrete under it um, the year before, and they put a gouge in the tree when they did it. I think it was WSSC. And, oh, my God, please don't do it again. There's like three huge old oak trees right there that he was getting ready to say, come dig this up and, and because it's off a percentage. Um, I don't, th he ended up not, um, at some point he said, Daryl will do the recommendations on that. Daryl originally said, called me. I really appreciate, you know, Daryl's been responsive in terms of an individual homeowner talking to her and told me that um, she had decided that, th that they would go ahead with that. And then she said, you know, well, if there had just been work done on this, that would be of more concern, and eventually did not mark up those particular trees, which I really appreciate. But there was no one telling us that it wasn't just those trees. It was trees, huge canopy trees right by the sidewalk throughout our neighborhood, just in several blocks. We did a survey, and 13 huge trees right within the distance, many of them right like within a foot of the sidewalk. Others are definitely within the tree protection plan permitting distance because they are in the critical root zone. And no homeowners were notified that you should take special, you know, here's why we're doing this. Uh, there's, no, there's no development of a tree protection plan that is posted, that there's a public comment period for, all of these wonderful things that I appreciate we have for homeowners to do. If I decide to put in a sidewalk on one side of my oak tree, I go through all sorts of things to get permission to do that. If the city decides to put in a sidewalk on the other side of that same tree, I can walk out tomorrow and they'll be digging it out. I think that that's a, I, I guess I would ask you, is that a violation of the spirit of the tree protection ordinance? And in, in regards to this, because the other thing is that Josh had very kindly offered when this concern came up on the neighborhood listserv that um, we could do a walkthrough with Daryl and we could go tree to tree and, you know, area to area. Another, one homeowner has a retaining wall that's threatened by this work. 
But I think that your injury occurred sometime in that period, and we were not able to do that. The work is going ahead. And we, as a homeowner, thought we would have this opportunity to be engaged in the process to say, please don't, don't do it around this tree. It's right, the trunk is on the sidewalk. And, um, and the Senate has it happened. So we are asking for an immediate stop work order so that there could be some public engagement on this process. Thank you. Council Member Wright, some comments? Um, I think the, I guess two comments. One is that um, I may have missed it, but my comment on the listserv was that I, I was happy to schedule a walk around and people should let me know. Maybe somebody emailed me and said they did want to have a walk around, but maybe you did? Okay, so I, I missed that. I apologize for that. But the reason I didn't was because I hadn't gotten feedback from people. So we'll, we'll do a walk around um, with Daryl and we'll make sure it happens um, as soon as possible. I'll talk to Daryl. You know, there is issues with contractors being engaged and where they're doing the work, but it may be that we can um, uh, make sure that we can talk about the particular areas of concern, you know, hold off on those until we have the walk around. Um, the second thing is I think uh, we are complying with the spirit of the, the tree ordinance and that it's um, the, the city arborist is actually very engaged in this process, right? So there's also markings about where things need to be hand dug and um, where there'll be uh, sand and then bricks laid as opposed to concrete, which is much more friendly to the, to the trees. So um, there's been a very concerted effort by Daryl and the city arborist to be engaged in that and, and, and mitigate as much as possible, and there's always trade off. Anytime you disturb anything, there's some chance, right? But um, so, did we have a formal process um, in the same way that if an individual applies for a tree permit? No, maybe we should look at holding the city to the same standard. But I think we did, uh, in the spirit of the of the law, have the city arborist engaged and and make sure that there was a tree protection plan for each tree. We didn't publish it and ask for public comment. Um, but I, and I'm, I'm happy to make sure that the walk around happens very soon. And if I can just add that, uh, as your, uh, as your comment about the, uh, the available money, the definition of how the monies can be spent, and the, uh, the possible ways that we have within that current definition of spending them, uh, I do know that. Uh, just just for the uh, the current definition for dealing with public safety of sidewalks uh, that when we had the the report back about the possible uh, ways to spend the money both to uh, correct the uh, ramps and ADA access and also to put in additional sidewalks and we were not including state highways at that point in the survey because at that point in time we didn't have the understanding that we've begun to have now that uh, State Highway can put high sidewalks in on State Highways but they're not going to maintain them, which we find a little odd. Um, the, the amount of money just to do the sidewalk improvements and installations on the streets that we control, I believe the, the total was $45 million in today's dollars. So. Uh, it would take, just to do that, it would take more than 20 years at current spending rates. So just to let you know that in terms of uh, trying to run through, you know, kind of run through monies quickly in, in current definitions, it probably would be quite a while. Um, Councilmember Robinson, you had a comment? I'll, I'll follow up on that. I think, though, so, uh, take another position on that. Bob, I think you're right in a way that, that these monies are restricted. I can see how I can imagine, although I don't know the thinking on the at the state level of uh, about speed camera revenues, that that they were perhaps protecting against cities using speed camera revenues for general fund issues or other things, and so put a uh, a limit. Um, but as was mentioned before, um, this year, and we don't know how far into the future this goes, they've taken in essence, the uh, monies that cars develop and said, well, you can't use those, we're not going to give you those monies, gas taxes, to fix your own streets. 
that was a linkage that was also made at the state level. So we've lost a lot of money to fix our own streets, and then we're restricted because of assumptions that are made at the state level. It's, it's all kind of crazy making from the perspective of up here. Um, and I don't know whether that, whether the ex expansion of the use of uh, speed camera monies to other forms can be made at district with our district 20 representatives or um, in other ways. But I'd, I'd certainly promote having that being that having that be a part of the conversation. Anybody else? Okay, uh, we'll move along to the city manager's comments. training uh, this week and next week. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to the item at your, um, at your place about the parking meter rates. Um, this is what would be going into the newsletter to identify the um, higher parking meter rates effective September 1st. And I wanted you to, to be aware of them. If there's any kind of issue, we need to hear from you very quickly. But that's, this would be our intention to publish this notice. This, this has to do in part with the um, uh, administrative regulations that follow the, uh, the legislation that we passed last summer um, where we tried to regularize rates and, uh, and so forth. And um, that came up um, as a result in part of, uh, of a request to have uh, meters on Laurel Avenue in Old Town changed from 30 minutes to one hour. Um, so I'm wondering, and, and I, I, I'm, I take it, I more than take it, I see that the administrative regs have been considered in a much broader fashion, which is good. Um, and I wonder if we've made any uh, headway on changing those meters on Laurel from a half hour to one hour since that was now a year ago and we were told that this would be a kind of an accelerated process and it would allow us to change small items like that in a hurry, but we're still kind of waiting, those of us who have uh, people who uh, want those meters changed. for you about that and but there's a little confusion about where the I think I know where the request originally came from um, what kind of support it has from the old Tacoma Business Association and we just need to gather that together before um, uh, but but we will get back to you with more information on that okay thank you soon that's all I had to say Follow up question. Um, I totally um, uh, agree with Councilmember Robinson, and I'm surprised we need to do any historical research on it because I feel like this has been like a, an ongoing drumbeat. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that we opened the regulation, redoing the regulation specifically to make it easier to deal with these issues. So it's just crazy to me that we have to do the research. The question I have is. Um, how does this compare? My sense is this compares favorably. These rates compare favorably, favorably to rates in surrounding areas, either in D.C. or um, large Montgomery County. It's not like we're doing something that's uh, uh, drastically different or more than that. If anything, it, it, my sense is we're catching up to those rates. Is that an accurate reflection? Um, I haven't. This is kind of new to me. But looking at D.C., is that comparable to the rates that are in the surrounding areas? Great. Thanks. Councilmember Seamus, did you have a question? Thank you, Mayor. No, just in uh, response to Councilmember Robinson's suggestion, uh, makes me think maybe we could use some kind of tracking system would be valuable. <laughs> just an idea. Oh, a new, a new, a new idea. <laughs> have I heard that before? I think Councilmember Clay had that idea. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Gilbert's going to have a really good time. <laughs> Who gets last week. Yeah. Did you have anything else? Yeah. Okay, we'll move along to our work session. And the first item is a discussion of proposed changes to state law regarding alcoholic beverage sales in Tacoma Park, uh, the possible addition of uh, adding permission, of requesting adding permission for carryout sales. And the deputy city manager is the resident expert on this um, and 
we received word last week that uh, the deadline for uh, getting any request into the delegation is not the usual deadline of early September, but is now October 7th. October 7th, yes. So that uh, my thought was that uh, we were kind of operating under a fairly, uh, on the one hand, accelerated time frame, on the other hand, not that accelerated since we've been talking about this for over a year. And we had things like a uh, listening session on March 29th, and we've had various opportunities to uh, hear from people about uh, their thoughts and to uh, see how we might want to go about this. Uh, my thought for tonight was that we could uh, try and come up with a specific option if that's what we want to do, and then put this option out uh, in the September newsletter, which would be coming out in early September and let folks know that we would like reaction to the specific proposal and we could have a public hearing on that specific proposal R rather than to date we've been talking in general terms about what if we were to go this route there are all these various options and we I think uh, recently we've had uh, a number of reactions to that possibility uh, with some reactions to uh, some fairly specific ideas in the in the residents' mind about what we were talking about, which may or may not be a direction that we're thinking about going. So I think tonight's discussion, if we can come up with, uh, you know, first, do we do we want to make the request of our Montgomery County delegation to uh, change the state law to allow a change in Tacoma Park, and if so, what that particular change would be. We've got a uh, page here from the Deputy City Manager with some uh, options, and I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And also, I've been speaking with Kathy Durbin of the um, County Slicker Control Board staff um, several times today. Uh, she's been very helpful. I think there's a couple things. Um, if, first of all, we had a public hearing last week, we have received uh, email um, testimony, and it's about 50-50 as to whether the city should go forward with legislation uh, to allow carry out alcoholic beverages or not, and different people have different feelings about what that might look like if they um, would want to see that pursued. There's several, um, there's many, many different kinds of licenses, but really, we're looking at um, three primary licenses that would be considered in Tacoma Park. Uh, one is a Class A license, which is your typical off-sale, carry-out, corner store place. And um, that's something that um, it doesn't have very many regulations related to it. Um, there has been some interest across Montgomery County um, of allowing some of those facilities to have on-site wine or beer tastings. And that's something that um, the Department of Liquor Control is looking at having changed in the state, legislat state legislature so that that could be allowed under certain kind of permit. Um, and um, then there is a Class B, which we already have Class B restaurants in Tacoma Park where you're allowed to have at a restaurant beer or wine um, on site and to consume on site but not to take with you. Um, one option is to allow uh, beer and wine uh, also to go at those locations. And um, the current rule is that you have to have 30 seats in a restaurant um, in order to have this provision. You have to sell as much beer, I mean, as much food as you do any alcoholic beverages uh, in terms of money, and it's closely watched. Um, there's a, there is some consideration to reduce the seating requirement to 20 because it's a 30, it sometimes is a difficult amount to, to meet. And they had recently reduced it from 40, so they're trying to make that work. Um, this is a category that um, the Department of Liquor Control thinks is a, is a good category um, because there's a lot of control over it. There's a lot of watching. Um, a question was raised, is that something like Adega has? And that is not. Adega has a Class D license. Nevertheless, um, a Class B license 
could go to a number of uh, facilities in Tacoma Park. And I know, for example, uh, several years ago, Manor Restaurant at, on Flower Avenue had requested that kind of an option where they could both have sell on site and do carry out. And because of our provisions, that was not allowed. Um, the uh, third uh, major category is Class D, which allows on or off sale but doesn't have the kind of seating requirements and that kind of thing or, or amount of food sale requirements that a Class B license does. And um, the uh, Kathy Durbin was saying that <clears throat> she believes that that originally came out from bowlings, from uh, uh, bowling halls that wanted to be able to sell beer and wine and have carry out there but not have to have a lot of food. And that's, but it's turned into the primary um, category that people do use other than a carry out restaurant, the carry out, uh, like a seven corner store kind of thing. <clears throat> In speaking with um, with Kathy and her staff, um, the uh, recommendation that they had was that if there is a desire to allow some carry out, but to have a lot of control over it, that a class B on on and off sale license uh, would probably be the best one to use. She also mentioned um, that their staff has been cut significantly through the budget cuts. Um, they're a little bit concerned about the control that they can have over some of the Class D licenses in Montgomery County. And so one of the things that they have been concerned about is, is the amount of time that they can enforce these provisions. She says they're going to enforce. She's very strict about that. Nevertheless, um, apparently it's, right now it's a challenge for them um, given the number of um, reduced workforce that they have. So I just wanted to bring you up to speed with that information. I think that um, in in all of the, well, thank you in all of these different discussions, there's um, not been a strong interest uh, expressed by the public of geographic areas for licenses or some really specific different kind of license. Um, it does seem to kind of center the, the existing categories seem to be ones that would probably meet the interests of those who have, have asked for something. Um, I would want to say that, for example, um, a, a uh, Class B on and off sale would probably not be something that would satisfy the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Co-op because, you know, unless they would have quite a lot of seating as part of a general expansion, um, they would probably fall in the Class A license category um, if they wanted to have um, those kinds of sales. Um, so that's, I just want to report back the information I've learned. Um, happy to answer any questions. And, and you said that the example of Adega in Silver Spring, that they have a D license, and that's because it doesn't have so many requirements. It's a lot easier to deal with. But they they do sell food and they do have seating. That's correct. But you so you can do food and seating with a D on and off. Right, it's but you're not restricted. But you you're not you're not watched as carefully. Right. And why is that? Because there's not the there's not the requirement of the um, equal amount of food versus I see. beverage you can't sales. Have food. You can you but can you, don't you have can have to have food. Correct. In a class D. Right. The difference between a class A, which is essentially a carry out, class A is you don't need bathrooms, you don't need all those kinds of things. Class D does require bathrooms, um, but it does in in other ways. It's um, much more flexible category. Okay. So I guess the first thing that we ought to do if we're going to work through toward a possible uh, proposal this evening is deal with do we want to go forward with any proposal or do we not want to go forward with any proposal? And then once we've dealt with that question, then we can deal with the next one if the answer is yes. So how about a uh, straw poll? Let's, let's try and make this easy <laughs> to start. It may devolve into more discussion. But uh, who wants to uh, keep going and consider do we want to uh, try and come up with a proposal? And the, the other option would be no. Over my dead body, I don't want to go anywhere with any of this. Don't, don't, don't talk to me about choices. No. So 
uh, how about people who want to continue and see if we can come up with a proposal to go forward? Hands up. Okay, I see six to one. So now we'll go forward. Um, I'll try and just slog right through this. Anybody want to consider a uh, possible Class A license? Who's interested in an A license? Who's not interested in an A license? Well, all right. Question. Yeah. Um, in the co-op's current situation, they would only be able to have an A license, right? Or I guess, yeah. I believe that's true. But well, I guess they might have bathrooms, right? So they. Well, that doesn't. That doesn't matter. I mean, they. They, they could do a, a, D, a D license. They could do they a could, D license, They could do right? a D license, I think. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So Discussion. If you do not permit a Class A or you're not willing to consider a Class A, what you may be then eliminating from consideration is the idea of a fine wine store in Old Town. Which I would imagine I've heard uh, the the head of the the old Tacoma what's her name association. Ross Grigsby. Thank you, uh, Ross. Say that they've had numerous inquiries from such uh, prospective proprietors who would like to be able to serve or sell that kind of product to that kind of demographic. Uh, I'm not making the case for or against it. I just want, at this this particular moment, just to su suggest that some people envision, may envision, that that's the kind of a, a store we, we really do need to have, where you can go and get, uh, for lack of a bit more uh, appropriate term, fine wines. And, uh, and and so forth, and things yeah. that go with it. If if I might, there's a couple there's a couple things I want to clarify. Um, one of the things under Class A is you could have just a Class A wine, light wine license, uh, where you don't sell beer. Um, you could have, um, or you could have both a class. You could have a Class A beer and wine license. So there's there is an option for um, an A wine. Mm -hmm. uh, license, or you could do as Adega has a Class D license. Um, I was going to go to Councilmember Robinson, Councilmember Wright, Councilmember Siemens. I, I was, I was going to, I guess, make the same point that um, just to clarify to, for my own benefit as well. A if to not have a Class A, you couldn't sell beer and wine only without bathrooms. If you if you had a class D, you could sell beer and wine as long as you had bathrooms. Is that do I have that distinction right? So in yes, Tacoma. I mean, there may be some other distinctions under the licenses, but I don't think there's anything significant. Okay. From from okay. the way that I've been briefed on this. So class D, you could sell beer and wine. That's all you did, and you had bathrooms. It's still legitimate, and you could you could serve food if you wanted. I think that's how I'm reading right. it. Right. And you can do tastings because you can have a right. wine sale. You could do tastings. So if you do a fine wine, you'd probably actually want a D, not an A. Because you would like to probably like to do tastings. It's just that the installation of public bathrooms have to meet ADA standards True. and all that. And it's a very expensive proposition unless they already be. happen to be in the facility. <clears throat> and, you know, people that going into the stores like this, uh, are, it's it's a retail store. It's like going into any shop to pick up something that you want. In a fine wine store, you might spend some time talking to the uh, clerk or the owner about what kind of wine they might recommend, but you're not going to go in there and spend so much time that, that a restroom is going to be a relevant determinant of whether you go in that store or not. A Just clarification. A, a clarification too is that, you know, there's no provision for a fine wine store. 
Yes. No, I understand. It, you know, the, when one of the, these categories can let in the kind of business you might want, and also businesses you might not want. Right. And so, That's there's understood. not there's not distinctions in those kinds of things within these license well, categories. The perfect case in point is the grandfathered store on New Hampshire Avenue. I think it's T and J. Is the name of it? Uh, fits the definition of a Class A license perfectly. Uh, and <laughs> it makes no pretense to be a quote fine wine store. It's not a class A though, right? It no, it's a, actually a it's actually a liquor store. Right, kind of sell hard liquor. It's yeah, all but I mean, it, it, yeah, but it comes close to approximating mm -hmm. what, what we're talking about here. And, but there's a big difference between allowing a store that sells hard liquor and selling a store that sells oh, liquor. And and if I can just remind folks, at least in my mind, I haven't kind of thought we needed to get into, at this point, a discussion of uh, location-specific licenses, because what I heard from all of you when, when we first brought this up was that uh, it, we didn't want to look at this as a, oh, you know, let's, let's tailor something to a specific location or neighborhood. We want uh, various commercial areas around the city to have the opportunity if we're going to have the opportunity anywhere. If I'm wrong in that, let me know, but I just do wrong. <laughs> I think that's a topic for discussion. Yeah, okay, okay, discussion. okay. Um, council member, I went in reverse order before. Council member Siemens. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I, you know, back when this, we, this topic came up for discussion, I said that I felt that the council had a lot more important things to work on than uh, the amount of time we were going to have to spend considering the uh, potential sale of alcoholic beverages and, and providing licenses within Tacoma Park. I think uh, we continue to spend time on it even after hearing strong public uh, feedback that uh, is at least um, balanced, if, but there is no overwhelming uh, support for changing our current policy. I, I think that uh, when we look at the topics we could be discussing to improve the quality of life in Tacoma Park, uh, this is not uh, high on the list at all. In fact, it's on way down on my list. Um, we've spent a lot of time on this already, and uh, we haven't heard the, the public support. So I, I feel like we're just continuing this now because of council support. Um, I have um, concerns about location. I think uh, I think it's kind of a double-sided thing that, uh, you know, we're hearing from the Old Town Business uh, Association that they would like to uh, uh, to have some flexibility for their economic development purposes, but at the same time, when we look at the uh, the time frame that this would actually take effect within the city, the um, uh, the benefit to our economic development is uh, marginal in the near term or non-existent in the near term, and that if we don't have improved economic development, which we're seeing without the licenses right now, quite frankly. I mean, Ace Hardware's moved in and, and uh, the cheese factories move in. We're really, um, the Old Tacoma Business Association is doing great work uh, without the licenses, so I don't see this as a uh, uh, in any way tied to uh, economic development. So anyways, uh, as regards to the uh, Class A, um, I would say no. And as regards to location, I think, uh, I think there are, are um, I don't see how you can distinguish, say, well, it's okay in one neighborhood and not okay in another neighborhood. Uh, I would just like not to see it anywhere in Tacoma Park. I think there are enough alternatives. Uh, close by for residents who want um, alcoholic beverages. I think there are uh, uh, enough uh, potential problems to the uh, city of Tacoma Park by implementing it. I think it's a bad idea. Councilmember Wright. Um, I just have two comments. Uh, one is that the people who have come and made public comment or written in are not the only people that uh, council members hear from. So the idea that um, that this is just being pursued because it's of council interest, uh, I think, is false from my perspective, because I've actually heard from 
uh, my constituents in particular when this came up um, a number of months ago to begin with, more like an uh, 8 to 2 ratio of people who are interested um, in having some sort of establishment in Old Town. So I just want to be clear about that. It's not, I'm not pursuing this because I think it's the right thing just for me. This is something that um, constituents have, have actually uh, reached out uh, about quite a bit. Um, and the second thing is it's a little bit of a catch-22, Terry, if right now we have done a great job of uh, filling many of the vacancies. Um, when this originally came up, it was because someone was interested in putting a a um, beer and wine store, uh, I don't know if I'd use the word fine, but a quality beer and wine store um, in the, the former um, midwife's uh, space. And, um, you know, they basically moved on because we told them it would be a two to three year process um, to, to make this happen or make it even possible. So I think um, by putting the mechanisms in place, if we do decide to go forward, that just allows the option in the future that it can happen. Um, and there may be the right uh, uh, business owner who's applying and, and in the right location um, that would work economically and make sense for overall economic development. So. Councilmember Clay. Um, you know, I, I personally don't object to any of these classes of license and um, I, I guess I don't get what the big deal is but that's I think in large part just due to my personal experiences growing up you know where I, where I lived uh, for one thing in the state that I lived in uh, all powers went to the city except those reserved to the state and so the idea of having to negotiate with the state over these specific uh, licenses is kind of crazy to me to begin with but um, but you know I just I don't see the same correlation between the liquor stores and the criminal activities that everybody's talking about um, it's, it's legal to drink alcohol if you're not driving while you're drinking it or drinking it in in public and so I don't have a problem with people being able to purchase it um, I would say my comments have been about uh, 10 to 1 from people who support it uh, without hearing any of the details. So then I'll ask a question like, well, do you support it everywhere in the city or do you want it limited? And for the most part, people seem, you know, generally supportive of it, at least in where people would want to, you know, in, in business districts and more too. Um, that said, I have had a couple of of constituents that are uh, what I call bellwether constituents. I don't know if you guys have bellwether constituents, but I, I have some constituents who are um, good measures of a particular segment of the population that's not particularly vocal. And I, I uh, and we, the council received a letter from one of those, and I don't, I think it's the, any, the letters are all public record, right? So I, I don't think he would mind me saying, you know, I got a letter from Jack Carson, it said that he. Didn't think this was a great idea, and and he is he has a um, he's a good bellwether for a particular set of my constituents, and so I got that, and I was like, ah, oh, well, this is interesting. I mean, I wouldn't object to letting people vote on this in the city, and whether or not we would have beer and wine licenses, quite frankly, because I'm on some level, I'm just I think my my personal bias is such that I really don't get why it's an issue, and so I wonder if there are people that I don't I don't hear in some way that have an issue with it, because I just I just don't have a problem with it. Um, I am the, probably the most vocal on the council that if you allow it anywhere in the city, you should, you know, you should allow it in a diverse area of groups in the city. I don't think it's great to say that the, the people who live in Ward 1 and in Ward 3 get to have a fine wine shop in the old Tacoma midwife section, and I can't, I don't drink wine, so I I hardly drink beer, but if I wanted to, I could go buy a six-pack of beer um, because that's what I I drink. So I, I'm not crazy about having a, a license that's just uh, uh, limited to wine either. I do think it, there are some interesting things about it, I think. And, and one thing that I would like to consider, um, like I, I would be supportive of a license that says, well, it has to be within a business district, for example. Um, uh, 
I don't know if that already exists because of the other economic development rules, but that seems reasonable because there are business districts in different areas of the city. The one thing I think is interesting about, say, the Class A beer and wine versus the Class D, yeah, there's the issue of how expensive is it to put in bathrooms, but um, there's, there's another issue, like if we allow for beer and wine sales in a way that lets our existing restaurants or existing businesses sell um, beer and wine, that might be different than just um, letting a beer and wine liquor store come in and possibly draw sales off of our existing long-time restaurants who have had an interest in, in, in this, because do, doesn't Marks have an interest in selling? They sell liquor and, and beer and wine. Yeah, they're not, selling. Not off sale, but they do not sell off sale. I thought they were one of the ones who thought that, that, that might have an interest in, in doing some off-sale stuff. I don't know if they, the, might. if they might. I don't know. Yeah. So, well, I mean, so that's maybe a question to consider. Is there enough interest within our existing businesses that might want to do this or do it as an augment to what they already do to help help boost the existing business and restaurant sale without maybe just having a specialty wine store? I think that might be of interest, too. Um, so those are my general comments about it. I just address one, one issue. The idea of location is primarily dealt, dealt with by zoning. And so a retail store wouldn't, would it be in a business area, it wouldn't be allowed you know, in a residential area that was zoned in that way. So it, it, it comes down to the zoning. They don't have other kinds of restrictions within the standard licenses. Council Member Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I kind of generally agree with Council Member Siemens on this that we're gonna we have spent and we're going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, and uh, in my ward, anyway, Ward Five, um, uh, most residents are generally opposed to um, the typical beer and wine store um, because there are a number of them nearby, and. Um, they just haven't seen any need for additional ones. Um, that may be because the residents are thinking of a store in Ward 5, uh, and we have very s a couple of small commercial areas, and I assume they're zoned commercial, so it's conceivable that uh, you know one of these small areas would get a beer and wine store. Um, Ward 5 is a little different because we're, we have <laughs> the Adventist uh, University and the hospital um, there, and they have a big impact. Um, and then we have a <clears throat> near Flower and Piney Branch, a set of commercial stores that um, have a, a, you know, a state, I guess it's Montgomery County store um, in the corner of Flower and Piney Branch already. So they don't necessarily see the need for an additional one. Um, but I have heard uh, a small amount of support for what we've been calling a fine wine store. Um, not a lot of support, but some support. But given the difficulty of ensuring that it's a fine wine store in Tacoma Park, um, they're all a little hesitant about it because they're concerned that it might not end up being a fine wine store. It could be like one of the places that they're not interested in having in Tacoma Park. So I'm... Um, you know, kind of very lukewarm about spending the time on this topic because I agree with Council Member Siemens that it's, we have many other things we could be discussing. I'm lukewarm because most of the residents I've talked to um, are, have pretty weak support for the whole idea, particularly in Ward 5. And what limited support I have heard is for a fine wine store, which is hard to ensure in Tacoma Park. So that's that's those are my general comments. <coughs> Councilmember Schultz. Uh, several comments. Uh, the first one I'd, I'd like to address to uh, Susie Ludlow, and that has to do with this, <coughs> the question of the ge geographic definition. And you make reference in your um, uh, memorandum here about the Tacoma Park Transit Impact Area that is special, specially carved out uh, area proximate to the metro station where there's a number of uh, 
in Tacoma Park um, that, that, that kind of gives a break to businesses in that area. Is that right? Can you elaborate a little bit on well, that? Well, um, yes, there's in the Montgomery County um, section of the, of the state, Alcoholic Beverage Code, there's a number of different geographic areas that where um, certain kinds of things can happen within certain enterprise zones. You can have two businesses that sell beer and wine or, you know, there's a, there's a variety of uh, uh, places. And long ago there was a Tacoma Park Transit Impact Area. Um, it's, it's been gone since the last master plan was adopted. Um, nevertheless, it, it keeps being referenced, and we have to go back to the really old maps to say, yes, it was in that area or not. It doesn't give a lot more preference, mm -hmm. but it is something that, that does pop up. Um, it, it gets a little more preference in terms of where, what um, a facility can be adjacent to, because mm -hmm. there are some limits as to what things can be adjacent to other facilities. So if there's some if there's some leeway there, but it's it's I think it's a rather strange thing because that zone no longer really exists. Thank you. I, I mention it simply because it might be a precedent for trying to draw a dotted line around a piece of commercial Tacoma Park, saying here will we will allow this, but over there uh, we will allow something a little different. Perhaps. Well, and I think that you'd have to, I mean, you could end up with the same kind of description of, you know, where the purple line stop will be coming in and that kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. you have to think about how that gets defined. Uh, another question is, is well, I noticed that the, the T&J store on New Hampshire Avenue, which uh, I, I patronized, has a Keno lottery uh, machine right. there. Right. Uh, and that a lot of the patrons that are in there aren't buying anything but lottery, Aquino uh, things. And is there a way, or could there be a way to say to any, uh, place that kind of a, a restriction, saying wherever there's any of this kind of sale of beer and wine under any license, that lottery usages are prohibited? I think there are. I think it does depend on the class. Um, I have to go back and, and look at those provisions. Uh, certainly, Kathy Durbin of the Liquor Control Board <clears throat> was mentioning that the, that the relationship with Keno can be a problem. Yeah, I would say. I mean, I can tell you that it is because it just, well, I don't need to pursue that. <clears throat> um, I would comment that in terms of incur or allowing restaurants, existing restaurants to do off-sale sales, uh, it may be a good idea in spirit, but in practice it's hard to imagine any restaurant wanting to do that uh, because from a practical aspect you've got to maintain inventory. Uh, and if you're going to be advertising that you sell say, beer off-site, or you're going to allow customers who come in to, you know, buy a nice bottle, you know, any kind of bottle of wine, um, you know, th that, that requires uh, inventory, it requires storage, it may even require, in some case, refrigeration. Um, and I, I'm just not sure whether uh, the kind of restaurants we have in Tacoma Park most of them being kind of in uh, scarce space, uh, would would even have the the wherewithal, uh, practical from a practical point of view, to to do that. Yeah, on on that topic, um, there have been restaurants who, that want the privilege that they feel they get more money if they're able to to sell off site, um, and as I mentioned, Manis in particular wanted to uh, pers um, pursue that previously, and I've heard. From other, and they went pretty far on that um, before we were able to to stop it. Um, and some other restaurants have mentioned it as well. Obviously, they have to balance their issues about space and inventory. Um, one of the things that um, is not 
permitted, though, from my reading of the regs, are advertisements that they sell off-site. Mm -hmm. So you can't put big, you know, s advertisements in your window that that they're having a beer sale or what that kind of thing. That that's something mm -hmm. that in a Class B restaurant it's not permitted. Another complex aspect, no doubt, of the, of the law. Um, what in, in terms of the uh, one of the issues that some some of the, uh, opponents have raised, which I think is a valid issue, is that no matter how, I'm afraid that no matter how well you try to carve out what it is we, as in our infinite wisdom, decide we want to have in Tacoma Park, you still have the in issue that if the existing owner decides to sell his business uh, and you can get another owner to come in who meets all the patriotic criteria that you can think of, uh, that person might just as well decide that they want to start selling, uh, say, a lower brand of uh, beverage. Night train. Hmm? Night train. Night train. Uh, <laughs> co co council member uh, Colleen recommend. Uh, not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, slip of the tongue. Ma mad dog. Yeah, mad dog. So that, that I think that's a legitimate con concern. You, you you can control all the tangible things, but the the intangibles of somebody sort of saying, "Well, I've just decided I want to broaden my inventory to to sell all kinds of crazy stuff that uh, might undermine the original vision." And in terms of my award, uh, I've brought this to the attention of po folks there. And it's been met largely with indifference, which in my mind is people saying we don't really care one way or the other which, which, you, which you decide. It's just not a big deal. We've got other things we want to worry about. So you can't say it's necessarily support, but you can say it's certainly not opposition. Um, and the comments that I've gotten, the few that I have, um, have been in support of the idea. But the level of indifference, I think, in Ward 6 has to do with the fact that we are along New Hampshire Avenue, uh, in addition to the, the one store that I've made reference to. There's, the, 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 there's other ones that, uh, further down on New Hampshire Avenue on the Prince George's side of the, of the boundary line, uh, several of them, and uh, the, plus others. Um, and uh, and that, that may be that, you know, over where I reside, that uh, folks just sort of say, well, it would be nice to maybe to have a store in Tacoma Park for an economic reason, but it's probably not necessary for a convenience reason. So I will, um, that will be all I need to say right now. And I'll share a few thoughts that I've got and then other folks have some more things they want to say. Um, I've been aware of some potential business owners who have felt that it would be a good idea to try and do that in Tacoma Park. I was aware of one or two who wanted to go forward. Um, <clears throat> I think it's good to have an option to attract businesses who want to locate here and provide services that people who live here want. My approach to it is, if we're going to do this, I don't particularly want to limit it to a particular geographic area and draw dotted lines around it. I'd, I'd rather keep it fairly simple and say, there, if we're going to go this way, that there's some kind of uh, off-sale provision that's available to people who want to do that. I've heard from people now over the last year, I guess, I, and I, at one point I kept, kept a pad on my desk and any time I'd get a, uh, any kind of uh, contact from somebody who with an opinion on this, I would keep track and I haven't done that in the, mo in the most recent go around with uh, people coming to the public hearing or responding submitting testimony uh, with the public hearing. But when I was doing that, it was probably running about five or six to one in favor of 
uh, some kind of proposal, and that was probably involving a, maybe 30 or 40 people. Uh, so in the, in the context of adding in the uh, public hearing testimony recently that was about split about 50-50, uh, it's probably down in the four to one range. Um, in, my, in my own mind, I've thought, well, kind of as I've talked to people recently about this, uh, I said, gee, I'm, I'm kind of thinking in terms of an example of a Dega in Silver Spring, not knowing that it was a class, D. would you say D? I was thinking of it in terms of a B. My experience of that location uh, is that they serve food, they have tables, you can, you can get uh, on sale <clears throat> uh, beer and wine, and that they also have, uh, I think of it as wine, but I guess maybe it's beer they and wine, uh, available. And it seems like uh, a good thing to do if you're there and having a meal and you say, gee, I think I'll try a glass of whatever, and you go, oh, that's really good, I'd like to take a little bit home, I'd like to serve that at a party, whatever it is, to have the option to do that, rather than going, gee, I'm going to have to go hunt for that somewhere, I wonder if somebody carries that. Uh, in my own mind, I kind of thought, gee, it would be nice to have uh, a linkage for uh, restaurants who have on-sale licenses to be able to also do off-sale. It sounds like there's been some interest in that on the part of existing restaurants. Uh, I like Class B because it does have the restrictions. It does have the uh, food and uh, wine and beer link. Uh, they have to have seats, they have to have bathrooms, it restricts the hours. Um, it seems like if I was going to support something that I would find it the easiest to support if there is such a category, um, Class B, wine, wine off, beer and wine on. If it isn't such a category, I guess it's wine and beer on and off. Yeah, my, my understanding, I, we, I can find out that... Um, I can check with that. One of the things that they made very clear to me is that no Class B restaurant can sell liquor off sale. Right. So that's right. <laughs> so that it's beer and wine. Right. Um, and I just but, don't know whether it's but not. You know, but there are places that are Class B beer, wine, and liquor. It's just oh. that you can't sell. You can't have that as an off sale with the liquor. Right. So okay. For example, Roscoe's could, if that license were available could continue to serve cocktails at their bar, but also sell beer and wine. That's home. my understanding. I'd have to, I'll have to double, really double check that. And certainly, even if you're just a Class B beer and wine, you can get a catering license through them that allows you to cater somewhere else that involves liquor. Mm -hmm. So there are some provisions, but um, there aren't, there's not a way to have liquor off sale other than from a liquor store. Because mm -hmm. I, th I, I don't think anybody particularly, particularly wants to open up to uh, liquor off sale. I'm, I'm assuming that's not on the table. Um, I'm still <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I don't object to any of it. Okay, okay. I'm assuming there isn't a majority that wants that. Okay. Um, so for what it's worth, that's where I am on this. Uh, if it, If we decide that we just can't get our our arms around a, something we can all agree on and it goes away, uh, personally it's not going to matter to me one way or another. So it's, it's not something that I think we absolutely have to do, but I'd like to make the option available and uh, make it so that uh, businesses who are here can stay here, uh, stay in business and continue to provide services that people want. And I've heard from a fair number of people who say, yes, it would be nice to be able to pick up a bottle of wine or something on the way home, uh, you know, as, as, we, as we talk about being a greener community and uh, wanting to encourage uh, pedestrian and bicycle commuting and mass transit, it's not the kind of thing where you're going to be, you know, carting home cases or six packs or anything else. It's going to be stopping to pick up a little bit of something on your way home, and uh, that'll keep the business local and uh, keep the services local. So that's my thoughts at this point. And we're back to Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. I just, as you know, it's obvious we're going to discuss this. And, and so I just think as we do that, and I have appreciated the discussions tonight, 
that we're really looking at um, the impact on the community uh, and what's been most beneficial to the community, both the residents of the community, the business owners, and and the government itself. And I'd just like to uh, point out that, um, you know, obviously the business owners uh, would gain improved revenues uh, from this because uh, alcohol sales have historically been uh, very profitable. Uh, but I also point out that uh, the, there had been some discussions during the public hearings about increased tax revenues, uh, and of course the sales tax revenues do not come to the city government. And uh, then there's also the inventory tax, which our business owners have asked us to uh, eliminate. Uh, so I do think we need to uh, keep that in our mind as we go through this. And then lastly, um, I think uh, since we have the luxury of time before a decision is going to be made, I think it's important for all of us on the council to uh, patronize those establishments within Tacoma Park and right outside of the city limits that currently have uh, the liquor licenses to see uh, if those um, are the types of establishments that we hope to see throughout our city. And I think that uh, location um, does vary. I think that, uh, you know, the more Mark's Kitchen uh, serving beer and wine now is much different than, um, you know, establishment in, uh, in Ward 6 that might sell uh, beer and wine now. That the, uh, uh, it has a much different uh, impact on the community. And I think that if we're looking at something that's going to be available throughout the city, that we should be uh, going out and patronizing each of these places uh, so that uh, maybe Council Member Clay can, can see why some people are objecting um, and, uh, and I can learn better why uh, uh, Council Member Clay sees no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Come to my hometown, I think, to figure that out why I see no problem. Road trip. <laughs> August is coming. Uh, Council Member Wright. Um, so I think it would be good to, to patronize those restaurants, um, but uh, I mean those establishments, one of the challenges is I don't think any of them just sell beer and wine. They're all sell hard liquor. Um, so I would encourage people to go to a day and see, uh, experience that as well. Um, I had a question, um, and then I basically will state what I think is my position at this point, having heard the, the discussion. Would it be possible, because right now the state law basically says that licenses can't be granted in Tacoma Park for these purposes. So it, it limits, basically says to Montgomery County, you can't grant a license in this area. Would it be possible um, for us to propose within the law that um, Tacoma Park also has to say yes. So it, we're not granting on our own, but that basically Montgomery County would have to say yes and Tacoma Park would have to say yes. If either one said no, then the license wouldn't be granted. We'd, we'd both have to say yes. Um, the county might not like that, um, but I would assume we'd be able to propose that with our delegation um, as something because I think that that would give us a bit more control about um, the establishments that, that open in our, uh, in our city. It doesn't get around the issue that owner A opens a certain type of establishment and then sells to owner B and owner B changes the establishment. But it would give us another level of um, uh, reasonable control uh, within the city. Uh, the, um, certainly the Montgomery County had made it clear earlier that that, that wasn't something that they would, um, that they would permit Obviously, we can take something else to the state legislature as part of a proposal. What I think um, is the critical piece is the criteria that you would be using and, and how it may be different than what the county might be looking at. Um, and that's something the, I think we would want to think through pretty carefully. I mean, the county has a pretty, you know, a pretty thorough list. Um, they're pretty... Um, they're pretty objective. You would have to, I think, decide what different kinds of criteria you might want that, that somehow would, 
distinguish uh, meeting a county criteria, which is, you know, you've shown this ID and these kinds of things versus some other kind of criteria. And so that's something if you'd like to talk about, I think, you know, I'd love to hear some direction on that and see how that would go. It was the biggest issue um, when we, for the businesses that were on the Prince George's County side of the city because basically the, the council could simply say, no, we don't want it. There was very little criteria that was needed at that point. And that was just the way that it worked under the Prince George's County provisions. Um, I know the council was unhappy that that was something they had to give up because that was a, that was a useful criteria when we went into Montgomery County. We no longer had that authority over those businesses that were on the Prince George's mm -hmm. County side. So um, anything's worth talking about? Um, you know, it, it may put you in an awkward position, too. So that's the, that's the, that's the other side of it, too, that you just have yeah. to think what criteria you might want. Well, I, I'd be in favor of having um, that be part of the law and, and work on the criteria. Um, so I, I think my basic position is that I would be in favor of allowing Class D and Class B licenses. Um, I have a preference for specific geographic locations, um, and in particular, kind of the Old Town area up to the junction, which would include the co-op. Um, but I am very sensitive to other council members' opinions about what's needed or um, desired in their own ward, so I wouldn't um, be opposed to it. I just think that like um, any kind of zoning or business control, you often do that around um, business purpose, and this is a, a particular business purpose, and we might think that in that particular area of the city, um, we're most likely to get the type of establishment we want, which is a um, I wouldn't call it a fine wine, but I would say a beer and wine shop uh, of Odega's, Odega's kind of um, uh, quality. Um, and uh, but I'm, you know, I, I hear other other uh, other council members' concerns that they would also want to be able to have it in their ward. Um, and then some council members, I think, would say they wouldn't um, in their in their district. So um, <coughs> that's that's kind of where I'm at. Councilmember Um It's hard. It's hard to balance. I know there's a balance that needs to be uh, drawn, and and alcohol has had uh, terrible consequences in people's behaviors for millennia. So that's a, that's a difficult one. Um, I, I kind of put that aside in a certain way because I think there's lots of lots of uh, balance in our society. And I come down more on economic development and on keeping money local, you know, um, supporting local businesses. And, um, and I also have a, a bone to pick with the county, as usual, um, in that they have a monopoly on, this, on the uh, distribution and, and sale of alcohol. And they also have a monopoly on the placement of, of uh, or the allowance of licenses. And so I'm very much in favor of Josh's point of us getting, us getting uh, some measure of control back, reserving the right to um, say where, where a uh, Class B or a Class D. I'm not, I'm not really in favor of Class A, but Class B and Class D licenses are granted. I think that, I think that would be crucial. In Virginia, they've uh, privatized beer and wine sales, and they're considering privatizing liquor sales, which looks to be a big fight right now. Um, I talked with a, uh, a man in Baltimore who was on the Baltimore Liquor Control Board for a period many years before ago, and uh, who then ran a also ran a bar and uh, for many years. And he said it's a, that's a business he would never get back into. It was a brutal and uh, often demoralizing business to sit across a bar from somebody whose life was going down the tubes and serve him another drink and serve him another drink. It's a terrible, terrible. Um, way to make a living, he said. Uh, I'm not really interested in geographic um, uh, draw, uh, specifying in state law w in which parts of our city are certain, certain licenses are allowed and certain aren't. 
Um, I think the fact that it's all in fine detail at the state level is uh, kind of absurd. Um, I, I think it's, uh, I think it would, if we're going to allow this kind of thing, I, I think we ought to allow it in, in um, stores like the Tacoma Park Silver Springs uh, Co-op. Um, and um, I'm intrigued with uh, Council Member Clay's notion that we could uh, decide this by referendum. I'd support that if that's what she was implying. And um, and I also want just as a final thing, I, I'd note that um, in Maryland you can't order alcohol, alcoholic beverages on the Internet. I believe that's the case. So there's uh, not only does Montgomery County have a monopoly on what beer and wine and liquor is, is, can be sold in um, the county, and, I, and I've also talked to enough business owners to know that that can make it difficult to get the, the beers and wines that you want because they have a minimum number of cases before you order, and there's a certain time period that uh, they sometimes adhere to and sometimes they don't. Uh, I don't think the, the state has any, any place in, uh, or the, in this case the county, I'm kind of repeating myself, has any place in being in that business. Um, I think I covered everything I need to. Councilor Robert Clay. Um, I would I would note that there's a there's a couple things that that um, are issues at the state level, which in previous conversations we've said we can't really tackle. But I mean, one of the issues that I think generates problems around smaller liquor stores is the sale mm -hmm. of individual cans of liquor the sale of large individual cans or bottles of liquor and the sale of, of cold alcohol that's ready to consume. And other states have successfully limited these things as a response to helping to reduce drunk driving, for example. So you can't run in and get a cold giant can of beer and get back in your car and drive down the road. And, you know, Maybe we should tackle that as part of, of what, at least to start the conversation is what we're talking about. The other thing is that I think most of my constituents be, would be happy if they could just go to the grocery store and buy a bottle of wine or a six-pack of beer. I mean, if we could just open up sales in the grocery stores and you could buy during the time that grocery stores are open, you know, the 6 a.m. to 1 thing, and you could, then you could buy it at the co-op and you could buy it at, what, the Expo, Mart, and... I don't know if there are a couple other, but there's a, few, there's a couple of places on New Hampshire Avenue that are essentially um, grocery stores. Um, Shoppers. Shoppers is in Prince George's. Um, I would support some kind of a vote. I, you know, usually I'm, a, I'm opposed to passing the buck and having the people vote because I hate ballot box budgeting and ballot box zoning. But it's kind of a cultural change for the city. It's a longstanding thing that the city has done. Um, we don't have a regular city election coming up, though, until next year. And so uh, maybe we could do a focus group, or Council Member Snipper suggested a citizen jury process, citizen which I don't know what process. that is. But, it's, um, it's an but, established process. Okay. But, you know, if, if there's a way to um, – if, if there's a way to do some kind of a, of, of a legitimate survey to get a better sense than maybe just people who happen to comment to us, I would totally support that, um, in part because I recognize that I just I just don't get what the issue is. The last thing I would say is if you all came back with a proposal that said that we were going to do beer or beer and wine and we were going to limit it to um, uh, Old Town and the Junction, I'd vote against it because I think it would be racist. Councilmember Schultz. Um, opponents have raised, a, I took notes at our public hearing on what each person said, and basically the oppositional points of view were that, uh, included the following, that these, uh, the liquor license uh, for off sale would generate uh, crime and loitering would generate trash, uh, would be of no discernible benefit to the city, and would hurt the image of Tacoma Park. Um, stuff along that way. Uh, and I, 
I don't know that it, that I, I agree with with uh, in, any of that. Um, and any business is capable of generating trash. Uh, 7-Elevens, like the one we have at the corner of uh, University uh, in New Hampshire, has all kinds of loitering, and the worst it sells is probably energy drinks. Um, so you get loitering uh, not based necessarily on uh, what's being sold inside the store, but because some place seems like a good place to loiter. I mean, there's a bunch of loitering around the 7-Eleven on Merrimack Drive at Carroll Avenue, uh, and there's no booze within a long distance of that. Um, it, I find it interesting that uh, you know we we know that in uh, in in Montgomery County, our municipality uh, does not have the right to do zoning. Or uh, you know, or make changes to the master plan. That's all handled at the county by the county. We don't have, in that sense, that authority or or capability. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we had zoning in the city, uh, then we would be able to very easily amend, uh, change our zoning ordinance to regulate the location of what kind of liquor licenses we wanted, in what commercial zones. But at this point, the conversation seems to be, and, and nobody would would make uh, uh, make uh, see see uh, any issue with that whatsoever. That that's just the normal way that municipalities conduct business. But because we don't have zoning, all of a sudden this is becoming uh, an issue of of uh, class and racism and uh, unfairness and that sort of thing. Which I don't, I don't see the logic of that at all. Uh, the fact is, is that these stores are open to anybody, and anybody can go to them at any time. Uh, the distance to a store is being is being the only criteria, or whether there's it's on a bus line or there's adequate parking. Um, so I, I I don't buy that case. I think that we ought to be able to consider a geographic area or uh, places in Tacoma Park, commercial areas in, the, in Tacoma Park where we don't want these kind of licenses to, to increase, and others in other areas of the city where we, where we the council uh, and, the, and the residents who we represent want these, these kind of licenses. Uh, and and um, we do know that the Tacoma Park uh, Silver Spring Co-op wants it wants the ability to sell. I do know that the owner of the Expo e-market would very much like the opportunity to uh, be able to sell uh, beer and wine. Uh, and she, she could at this point in time. I think the uh, uh, under the county law, grocery stores grocery uh, have the right to sell it. I think you said, Susie, but, that but not chains within, can only have one location. Right, but not within Tacoma Park. But there's no, there's no, come. there's no carry out right. provisions for Tacoma Park. I mean, Park. so, but in many other municipalities across our, our uh, country, uh, in many states, it's not uncommon at all to be able to go into a, a Safeway or Fresh Fields or what have you, and buy your beer and wine. And uh, the fact that we can't do it here strikes me as absurd. Um, and you know, then I also would raise the question: Is why should any citizen in Tacoma Park, resident of the city, have to leave the city boundaries in order to do to do this kind of a purchase? Doesn't I mean it's not a big deal? It's not you know, it's not like we have to drive you know umpteen miles, but I mean, but but basically, why should we have to leave our city? Why can't we, as as Councilmember Robinson says, you know, uh, can, can Keep our economy local. Keep 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 the dollars in the city as much as possible, and, and until somebody can also, to add another point, show me that we've got a lot lesser rate of alcoholism and vagrancy and drunk driving in this in this community because we don't have certain kinds of licenses here. 
uh, I'm not going to be persuaded that it's something that's going to corrupt our, our city and our citizens. And also I'd like us to be able to think about, as one of our uh, people tes testify, is that right now we don't have the ability to have a brew pub if somebody wanted to open one. In Arlington, for example, uh, we got plenty of brew pubs over there, and they're a lot of fun, and they're uh, a great place to uh, um, to do some, you know, have have an, have a, 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 a to be able to taste a variety of beers. Now, maybe Montgomery County just doesn't like. Maybe it's a county issue, and not a city issue. I don't know, no, but that's. Have some. You know, be something. It'd be nice that 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 um, an entrepreneur could contemplate the idea of uh, uh, proposing the opening of a brew pub somewhere in, in Tacoma Park, and it might be very successful. I would think. So those are th those are my feelings. I I I, I don't have any op uh, real particular reason. No one's given me a reason to oppose any of these classes of of licenses here that that I think are going to harm our city. I've heard various arguments about things that we ought to try and do. I feel like in some ways we're tilting at windmills. Um, and well, that's fun though. Have to, and yeah, but in, in this case, <laughs> we're a city of approximately, I always use the figure, 19,000 people. We can't be all things to all people. And we've got a limited task ahead of us. If we want to do something about this, this year, we've got to get a bill submitted to the county delegation by their deadline of October 7th. Right, they have to get it submitted, so we need to get it to yeah. them before, before that, that so they can sub have time to submit it. It has to be drafted. So if, if we're going to do this, we've got to come up with a specific proposal, and I would recommend that we advertise that proposal and have another hearing when we come back in September. And if we're going to do that, we need to get as far along as we can on it tonight, and if we have to do any final work on it, we could continue the discussion next week. We don't have unlimited time. We've got people here for another item or two. And uh, therefore, I'll take a stab. I'll toss something out at the table. You all can take shots and throw needles at the balloon. But I'll throw out there that we, that we say uh, that we would like to add uh, class beer, cla class B wine and beer off license in addition to the uh, current Class B on-site licensing that is currently available. Therefore, restaurants could add off-sale to their on-sale, and that that's what we go forward with. And maybe I can get majority votes to do that. If not, somebody else put something else out there. But we gotta we gotta do something or just say we're not going to do it because. Any of these other things about, you know, uh, referendum or uh, whatever any of the other proposals were, that throws it over to next year. And we've already kind of done that once, saying we need time to go through this and come up with something. So. Uh, I think that's appropriate to pick something and try to make it happen or, or not. I mean, if we can't get support for some, one of these things. And uh, I don't, I think we should still keep talking about these other issues, but let's try to do something now. I support that, uh, D. Or B. B. Number three. Yeah. Option number three. Yes. Council Member Stimple. Um, I don't because I think we need, as Council Member uh, Clay was indicating, I think we need more input from the citizenry about this. I think we've heard a wide diversity of pros and cons on the Council. Um, uh, I don't necessarily think that uh, business needs should drive what we do in the city. Um, the fact that a man a restaurant wants to be able to sell off-site when they're virtually across the street from a liquor store, I don't find particularly convincing. Um, so uh, I really don't support going forward with uh, Class B until we've 
heard more from, the, for instance, that we've had a public hearing or some similar uh, ballot thing. The, and what I was proposing was another public hearing in September. Yeah, well, I, I support that part. <laughs> Council Member Clay. Well, uh, structurally, I, I'm okay with uh, option three because I think it's fair to any restaurant in the city, and it does allow you. I mean, it's a solution that I find viable. I wouldn't object to it. I, um, and I, I guess um, I feel like another, you don't feel like another well-advertised hearing would get to, to a, um, that is to a specific proposal, because we haven't really put out a specific proposal. We put out a specific proposal and said, this is your chance to come out of the woodwork and and comment. I think we're likely to get more negative comments that way because people are opposed to it come out and the people who support it stop me in the street and say, oh, you know. Right. But, hmm. okay. And it's hard to have a discussion of a specific proposal in a public hearing. So right. right. And I guess I, I don't feel rushed to do something this year. Uh, Councilmember Member Schultz. Um, I would support the idea of Class B licenses, but I'd also support the idea of getting the state to allow us to permit grocery stores to sell beer and wine, because most grocery stores already have the restrooms there, um, so they could get a Class D license if that's the uh, thing. But I, I just, I just think that, uh, and, and that would be a bigger battle. Can, can I don't know why grocery stores get a Class D license? Yes, that's, we'll probably ask that. Well, it's not class B. That's that's for restaurants. So they only can get D. So, uh, uh, Mayor, are you are you starting with B and then seeing if, if you get support for D? That's what I would suggest that you start with B and see if you have support for B and then throw D on the table and see if you have support for D. I'll let you throw that one on the table. Okay. But but you're um, working on B right I'm now. So. Working so we can try and either. <laughs> Never mind. And just, and just to, I, I guess, just to clarify, for example, the best way rest, the best way supermarket on Piney Branch has a Class A. Um, a couple other supermarkets have Class A licenses, so that's that's yeah. apparently oh, the one that the they class use. Right? Yeah, but they don't have anything specific to a grocery store. It's just they are eligible to apply for a Class A license. Right, and and I go to Snyder's grocery store, and they sell beer and wine. Mm -hmm. I support D. We have B on the table. We, we got Councilmember Wright with the comments. Yeah, I support so let's B. just make this real simple. Everyone in favor of B, raise their hand. Okay, we got B. We okay. got four. Okay. okay. Uh, everybody in favor, in favor of, of B D. and D, raise their hand. D is the is the have to have the bathrooms. Um, B and D, raise their hands. We've got four. D, you have to have bathrooms. Okay. You have to have bathrooms, but you don't have to serve food. We have four for that. And my last thing would be who's in favor of um, pushing for uh, Tacoma Park to have approval in addition to the county? <laughs> that would be nice, but we got to lose. Yeah, but we can, we can, we can put it in there and, and, and in the course of the legislative discussion to see right. if it. I guess. The only thing I wouldn't want to do is give people the impression that that's necessarily part of the package and they're supportive of B and D if, and because we're going to get approval for us having approval and then if, we, if that doesn't happen, which I think is likely, then they say you sold us a bill of goods, we thought you were going to have control and that's why we said yes, no problem. Who, who would say we thought we were going to have control? I think it has to do with how we do it in the public. In the public record, we say we're pursuing this, but we don't. We're not optimistic that it'll come to fruition. That would be helpful. Are we done? No. Well, how about who was would be in support of a, a geographic identified area for certain license types of licenses in okay. Tacoma Park? Raise hand. I'm in favor, but I know. Um, you know, we might as well get everything else on the table here. And uh, how many are how many are in favor of A? Let's just you know, 
get that get that out there too. Okay, well, just you know. Okay, so we had two for that one. So B and D have bare majorities, mm -hmm. and nothing else flies. Right. So uh, we will put together the newsletter. We'll have a story on this explaining possibility for B and D, that there will be a public hearing in September, and we'll work out the timing for when that has to be in order to make sure that people get the notice in the newsletter, but we do it soon enough that there's a chance for somebody to draft a bill to have the draft in or close to done could, by October 7th. Could uh, okay. we have staff uh, put this item on, on, uh, on our website so that people can have the advantage to understand the distinctions between these various licenses like we have? Yes, that, that information is there, but certainly as we already, but as, certainly as we um, go forward, we'll, we'll put something special that indicates what's being proposed here and the, right. and the information about those particular Thanks. licenses. You have to draw people's attention that, mm -hmm. it's, that this information is there. Yes. Because it's confusing. It is. Okay, anything else on this item? Okay. Um, we're through with that item. We're going to take a short break, but before we do, Councilmember Wright has something to say before he leaves. Um, you know, again, I have to depart because my elbow has continued to be problematic. Um, I did quickly want to say that I'm in favor of the renaming of the urban park uh, as the Gilbert Combe Park, and um, in generally in favor of allowing youth to be appointed to the committee. Uh, committees. I'm sure there's some specifics that would need to be worked out about that, but just wanted to share my opinions quickly. Okay. We'll take a very short break, and we'll be right back for the next time. Go back in time. Back for the break. <laughs> Summer break. Okay, we're ready to go again. And the next item is a discussion request to Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission to rename Tacoma Urban Park as Gilbert Combe Park. Um, Councilmember Robinson. Yes. Um, this has been a good process. It's been a long, longish, not too long, but longish process to get it to this point. And this point is our um, consideration. I'm hopeful that we'll uh, adopt this resolution to support the um, to support the renaming of this park. And um, we need to have uh, the Park and Planning Mark, um, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission do that renaming because it's a an, uh, an MNCC MNCPPC. Gosh, I'm having trouble getting my acronyms right. It's, it's their park. Uh, there's a little funny story to it, and that is that it used to be named, it is currently named Tacoma Urban Park um, because it's in the urban part of Tacoma Park. Uh, and uh, not so long ago, uh, park and planning um, uh, replaced the sign there. And lo and behold, the sign, that, the new sign, they left out the word urban. So the, na the current name of the park, the current sign says, Tacoma Park, <laughs> as in it's a park in Tacoma. And that kind of kicked off a discussion about whether 
or not we just wanted the sign replaced properly with the current name, Tacoma Urban Park, or whether uh, we wanted that park named and uh, ha have some other name. And the, the Waco neighborhood and others uh, went through a good um, process of considering other names uh, over the course of several Waco neighborhood meetings. And once the Gilbert Combe, um, the, the notion of Gilbert Combe being the person after whom that park was named, came up, it uh, I felt it gathered um, momentum rather quickly because Gilbert was much loved and respected in the neighborhood. And um, there was a real outpouring of, uh, of uh, respect and, and uh, thought of, of his memory, of, of it being in his memory. Park and planning has a, a general rule not to name parks, local parks, after people, but they have an exception, and they and with support from a neighborhood area and and I think support from us, there'll be a, a much better chance of that renaming going through. So, um, having heard a good deal about um, uh, how Gilbert Combe was was loved and respected in the neighborhood and how he contributed. Um, I think I think a lot of these uh, whereases describe what's going on here. And can I read those whereases? Is that an appropriate sure. thing? So I'm just going to read the, the whereases and the therefore. And here we go. Whereas Gilbert Combe was a much loved and respected resident of Tacoma Park, native of Zambia, who contributed to the quality of life in our community for many years, and whereas Gilbert Combe passed away on November 6, 2009, and whereas the park known officially as Tacoma Urban Park lies in the area of Tacoma Park where Gilbert Combe lived and played and his family still resides, and whereas Gilbert, Gilbert Combe was a humanitarian doctor who was a role model and mentor, mentor locally and globally, and whereas Gilbert Combe's work in charity, HIV pre prevention worldwide, commitment to the homeless, was a model for all of us, and whereas Gilbert Combe was a tremendous asset to the community, to our community as a parent, coach, doctor, and athlete, and whereas numerous friends and neighbors of Gilbert Combe in the area surrounding Tacoma Urban Park have expressed an outpouring of interest in renaming Tacoma Urban Park as Gilbert Combe Park, and whereas supporters of renaming the park feel that Gilbert Combe embodied the open-hearted, globally aware spirit of Tacoma <coughs> Park, and whereas renaming Tacoma Urban Park as a tribute to the work and life of Gilbert Combe is supported, by his family and the Westmoreland Area Community or, uh, Organization, and whereas the city of Tacoma Park supports renaming the park to Gilbert Combe Park. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Tacoma Park, Maryland, that the city of Tacoma Park supports the renaming of this park and expresses this support through this resolution to be forwarded to the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission and to Montgomery County. And I understand that uh, a couple of people who are here would like to uh, say a few words. So if you all want to use the podium. Nope. Uh, I'm Gilbert Combe's wife, or I guess I should say widow is a new vocabulary word for me. And when we were house hunting, we told the realtor we only wanted to live in Tacoma Park. And we kept on driving down Westmoreland Avenue for more than a year looking at houses. And my husband said to me, if we could just find a house on this street. And it was at the moment when, when Westmoreland Avenue dips down and you're passing a pretty park on the left. And of course, in the end, we did, we did end up getting a house on Westmoreland Avenue. And so it seems um, like very poetic if in the end that park is named after him. I am Adrian Combe. I am his son, and I always thought it would be good um, to have something to remember him by, and for newcomers to see. And it would mean a lot to me if it was named after him. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief. I'm Lois Wessel. I live on Westmoreland Avenue, in fact, next to the park. Um, I'm sort of the one who manages the park and planning people who 
try to come clean up the park and clean up the leaves and cut down trees around my property and other such things. And I um, definitely support uh, Dan and all his work he's done in trying to figure out this somewhat arduous process between um, the City of Tacoma Park and MNCPPC and getting the park renamed. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to briefly say that when we put this out to the community, there were a few other names that came around for the park, um, and also keeping it as Tacoma Urban Park or renaming it Westmoreland Park or Gazebo Park. But there was an outpouring of support, and, and I won't bother you with reading all the quotes I have because I think um, Karen and Adrian can say much more than, than all the people who, who came out and um, supported naming the park after um, Gilbert Combe. But um, I think it's been a really interesting process in the neighborhood to kind of gather around and um, think about naming the park after somebody that we've done so many other times in Tacoma Park, Becca Lilly Park, the new Bell Ziegler Park, um, Opal Daniels Park. Um, and so we sort of have a history of naming parks after people, and I think that most of us would agree that both the street and the um, park named after General Westmoreland is really not in um, thinking of the kind of character that we would like to um, honor and emulate, um, but that naming it after Dr. Gilbert Combe would be that person that we would like to honor and remember. Um, and and I, I'll just pass to, to Suzanne and Jesse so that you can all um, see it in case you haven't. The very lovely um, uh, obituary that was in the Washington Post that describes much more of, of Gilbert's work. <laughs> there you go. Um, hi, my name is Emma, and I'm Emily's friend, and um, whenever I go to that park, I would think, oh, that would be so nice to just to be named after, like, my best friend's dad. I was just going to um, be brief, too. Um, my wife and my two boys and I uh, have lived in our current house for about eight years, we're about to actually move. Um, one of the great joys of being in that house has been getting to know um, Karen, Emily, Adrian, and Gil, and easily one of the toughest things was, uh, the toughest thing over the last eight years was the loss of Gil. And I would, um, just keeping it brief, I would just say you, you talked about there being, being an exception to the rule. And I would just say definitely what you're hearing and definitely what I experience is this is a person who's quite exceptional. So I appreciate you taking this up and um, we'll be behind it as much as we can. And Lois, thank you very much for spearheading this. It, it's really fantastic. So thanks. Thanks to all of you for uh, coming and expressing your support and uh, sitting through some some other discussion before yeah. getting to this. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll, maybe maybe it'll be with uh, Westmoreland wine. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Council Member Clay. So um, I'm actually going to suggest an alternative to this uh, this resolution. Um, I appreciate you all coming out and uh, coming to talk about how important Gilbert Combe is to you. Um, I think in, into the community. So the, um, for the reasons that you guys talked about, that this is a county park, uh, that we have, um, uh, we don't actually own the county park. The county itself you know, rarely names parks after people for probably the reasons that I'm going to illuminate here. Um, it's, a, it's clearly a, a citywide resource, not just a, a wacko resource, countywide resource as well. It's a, it's a county park um, that, and, and that, in fact, we have, we have few parks that are named after people in the city. I would say that we have, we have Becca Lilly, Bell Ziegler, and Opal Daniels Park, which, you know, not a lot. What, so um, we have a lot of people who, who, well, frankly, not a lot. We have people who die unexpectedly um, in our communities, and um, 
I didn't know Mr. Combe, but um, some of my neighbors did and uh, talked to me about it and asked if I had known what would happen and, and came and talked to me about um, his importance to the community and how they knew him through school and, and other things. Um, I unfortunately have had uh, folks who have passed on unexpectedly in this year. We just recently, two months ago, lost Amy Polk in our uh, community. Um, prior to that, uh, we lost uh, Sandra Gruber, whose uh, family had lived in the community for many, uh, many years. And um, and the mayor reminded me earlier that we lost, also lost uh, uh, Jim O'Brien from, from our, our community as well. And I know that other folks have lost other folks from their community. Um, one of my children came home this year, and one of her classmates' mother had, um, had uh, passed away unexpectedly in her in her 40s also. Um, so what I would like to uh, suggest is that we, uh, rather than looking at the park, uh, look at other things that we can do to do these, to do an honorarium. So um, one of the suggestions that has been talked about is that we actually do have control over things in City Hall. And, and can name portions of the building and rooms and, and structures also after somebody in the city hall, which we fully and completely control, for example. Um, we can uh, name streets after people. Um, and I believe that we control, is that true? We control the street names within the, um, the city that we can do. Um, we have other other kinds of things where people do, you know, park benches and trees and other things like that. Um, and um, I would like to propose that we that we do that, and not only that we do that in this instance and, and look at some of these other folks, but that we actually set up in the city a mechanism that we can use to um, to do this uh, going going forward, essentially. Councilmember Snipper. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I too have had the same thoughts that um, Councilmember Clay has, has had. Um, I, I really support the idea of honoring what I call local heroes. Um, and uh, I, I think it helps folks understand when we do this, it helps our, our neighborhood, our communities to understand that they can do extraordinary things too. It isn't somebody far away and you know, somebody you don't know, but it's somebody, your neighbor, you know, who can do these things. Um, and that means that you can do them too. And the thing I like about Tacoma Park is uh, we, ha we have quite a few people who do extraordinary things in our city. Um, as you all know, I'm sure you have friends and neighbors. Um, it's kind of cool to find out about them. You don't always know until uh, we had, a, we had a, a neighbor die a few years ago, and um, he worked at the Federal Trade Commission um, for decades. He never lost a single case. And, um, you know, I never knew the first thing about it. I never knew anything about it until after he died. Um, there are people in our community who we need to know about, and um, I really support honoring them in a way that the city has control over, that we're not dependent on whether park and planning gets around to letting us do it. I just find that a, a bad dynamic for us because inevitably they will say no. And, and they won't say no on the basis that of, of what Tacoma Park would agree is a good reason. They'll say no for whatever the county decides is a, is a good reason. So um, I'm wholly in support of the suggestion of Council Member Clay that we come up with a way of, of doing this. And it'll allow us to not only decide where uh, we want this commemoration to be, but the form of it. Should it be just a small plaque? Should it include photographs? Should it include a little bit of history? Um, it allows us control over what seems the right thing to do in the, in the particular case. Um, uh, it might be a mural. You know, we can imagine that somebody might be honored by having a, a whole mural made in their honor, uh, but that wouldn't be appropriate in, in some in some other case. So I'm I'm thoroughly uh, in support of of this um, kind of what I think of as an alternative um, way to do this. Uh, anyway, I'll stop there. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as is so often the case, I uh, I agree with Councilmember Clay. 
that we need a way of honoring uh, many people, and I think here in the City Hall it would be a great location to do that. But as uh, is also not uncommon, I don't agree with her entirely. Um, I think, uh, and, and you know, I'm looking back at the um, at the obituary, the article was written in the uh, Washington Post, and as I read this, I read about a man who uh, grew up in a community in Zambia that, uh, at a time that uh, the AIDS epidemic was uh, really just uh, beginning. And he recognized that uh, although his family and his, his brothers chose to be engineers, uh, he recognized the problem in, in his community that he felt it was more important for him to do uh, something else about it. Rather than just become an engineer and make a lot of money, he decided to, uh, to go into medicine and see if he couldn't help his, uh, his community members. Um, and I, as I read this article, I'm uh, really touched by how he kind of epitomizes the view that we have of ourselves here in Tacoma Park, that uh, he is uh, really appears to have strived for social justice and, and uh, uh, throughout his life. And he went on to, uh, to become a, uh, a renowned physician. Uh, he did work uh, to uh, bring uh, remedies for HIV and AIDS to 114 countries, uh, but he didn't uh, just focus on one thing. He still continued to reach out to humanity, uh, reaching out to uh, homeless people, and uh, I'm sure many other things that, that I, haven't, uh, I haven't learned about in the short time that I've known him. Uh, known him posthumously through the, uh, uh, through the newspaper article. But the, the, my point is that uh, I think as a community we want to have uh, pillars that we can uphold to our young people uh, to give guidance to them in their life. And um, as I look at this and I say, well, uh, what is, what's going to be a better thing for the community, uh, a park named, you know, Gilbert Combe Park, or a park named Tacoma Urban Park, uh, it seems like a no-brainer. I mean, it is a no-brainer. There's uh, no question about it. Uh, I fully support this. I think that yes, there are many other people in the community that de deserve to be honored, but uh, I think that we we should continue that discussion and find a way to have a hall of honor here at the community center uh, so that uh, young people coming through this hall and through this community center uh, see every day examples of what they can do with their lives uh, if they want to. And uh, this is a man that wanted to and did, and I, uh, I fully support the renaming of the park. Thank you. Councilor Barbara Schultz. And that is on this, is that, you know, first I guess I just want to say to uh, Adrian, he went out, and, uh, the, you know, the, I can tell by his testimony that this was a very hard for him to, to get up there and speak about his father without being overcome by emotion. Uh, I, I lost my father as a young man and lost a, son, a, a stepson as a young man. And, uh, and those are things that uh, you just never get over. So if he were here, I'd want him to understand how emotional this sort of thing can be. My concerns are, are basically that parks in Tacoma Park are large and they're few and far between. They're scarce. And I think the renaming uh, of the parks probably needs to be reserved for people who have contributed mightily to to the city pr pr itself, notwithstanding what other great works that they have done. Um, there isn't any question in my mind that Gilbert Combe needs to be honored uh, publicly, uh, physically. Um, I am just, I am 
concerned, however, that the, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission really gets to call the shots, notwithstanding our vote here, um, may very well turn it down for their, the, their criteria. And then where are we? We're right back to square one. So I'd like us to give some thought here as to what alternatives there might be to uh, dignifying uh, Dr. Conde's uh, work uh, and his impact on, on so many people, not just locally, but really worldwide. Um, there's lots of ways, as, as uh, Council, Council Member Clay has already indicated, that we, we could do that. Um, I mean, I, I think maybe just putting a plaque on, on the wall there at, at that park would, would be a, a, a tribute to, to him that would allow the family uh, and, and the neighbors there to always remember his, his significance, notwithstanding the name of the park. Um, you know, a lot of times I find myself, who's, uh, as a subscriber to the Post, reading obituaries of, of, of people that I didn't even know they existed until you read their obituary. And it makes me feel like I'm a fool and, and I have my, I've had my head in the sand or something like that. And this is a perfect case in point. Here's a gentleman who, who's, in a sense, a neighbor uh, that I didn't even know existed. And this happens all the time uh, around here. And I, and I think it's I think the idea of honoring people such as uh, this, this gentleman is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a wonderful idea. I'm just not sure that naming a park after him is the right way, as, as Councilman Snipper su suggested that, you know, uh, that maybe the better, the, the wiser uh, approach is to do it in a way that where we have total control. Uh, over the uh, over the naming, we don't have to get somebody else's per permission outside the city of of Tacoma Park. Uh, and, and there's a mul multiple ways that, that that could be done. So that would be kind of my sentiment. I, and I guess in effect, I sort of come out on this kind of thing, pretty much the same way that the two council members on my left have have spoken on this thing. There's, there's a number of people undoubtedly in, 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 in the city of Tacoma Park um, who will ultimately we will want to honor. And I think we need to uh, sort of think about that as to how we do that in a way that uh, truly honors the person, uh, makes, you know, set, as Councilman Siemens talked about, it, you know, gets the, the idea of the, the existence of this person who's really kind of like a hero uh, into the public mind, and it just isn't lost as soon as somebody throws out a particular edition of the Washington Post with their obituary in it. Uh, because I, I think we, we, we really should do that. That should be a way of enriching uh, our, our city's history uh, in a humane sort of way. So that's that's my thoughts on it. And if, um, I just want to add a couple thoughts. Um, it's it's interesting to me that uh, earlier this evening we had some uh, discussion about uh, ideas that uh, are thrown out there, and then we kind of go on and then come back around to them again. And uh, this. This instance reminds me of that in that uh, I've been talking with Historic Tacoma and uh, with staff for quite some time about uh, Tacoma Park has, has a long history and we, we tend not to know about a lot of it and, and we need to honor people in this building and outside this building and in our parks and in our facilities in ways that we just don't do. Our, our history starts in many ways in this building about 20 years ago, and that's that's all that people know. And that, as Councilmember Siemens, I think, very eloquently said, that uh, we, we need to honor our heroes and have the examples for everybody to uh, to look up to and to understand and to see who's, go who's gone before and made way for people to do the good things that they'll be capable of. 
I think in this instance, uh, we need to honor the work that has gone before us in the neighborhood, in the Westmoreland Area Community Organization, with the neighbors who care so deeply about Gilbert Combay. And I think we need to uh, approve this proposed resolution and send it forward to Park and Planning and hope that they do the right thing. And I think we need to be prepared for the fact that if they don't, whether they do or whether they don't, we need to uh, honor our heroes and be prepared to <coughs> honor Dr. Kambe and many other people uh, in ways that we control and that we can, we can feel locally. And so I would propose that we pass this resolution and that we be prepared on a parallel track to go about setting up uh, a way of honoring Tacoma Park residents here in Tacoma Park. Councilmember Robinson. I didn't put uh, forth the notion that there's a, a that that we may well not prevail at park and planning because I think we will prevail in this renaming at park and planning. Um, from the discussions I had with them, they said if there's community support, particularly if there's council support, uh, they saw no no reason that it wouldn't be couldn't be renamed in his honor. So I'm glad that we're going to take it to them. But at the same time, I agree with my colleagues um, that we need to have this be a, that, w that would be good, it would be a good idea to set in place a way to honor all our heroes or more of our heroes. So. Councilmember Stevens. I would just like to thank the people who came here tonight and supported this. Uh, and I uh, offer my condolences for the loss of your husband, but uh, admire you for, uh, for coming here and, and helping to push this important thing forward because I think it really is important to the youth of this city. Uh, and one of us here is still with us tonight who should be probably home in bed at this point. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thanks. So we will uh, bring that resolution forward next week. Good night. And we have a uh, final item tonight, a uh, discussion of youth appointments to committee. And we had had some earlier discussion about this uh, when we had an instance of a uh, 13-year-old coming forward. We went ahead and named that person. We thought maybe we wanted to have a little discussion about uh, how to go about Thinking about that, not just in the in the instance of that particular one, but whether that's uh, something that we wanted to uh, encourage or discourage, or just leave it the way it is and take it on a case by case basis. What do we want to do? How do we want to make things clear? And the clerk has some comments. City of Bowie. Uh, let me find my folder here. Um, I put out a call to local clerks to see what other what other cities do. And um, let me start with the city of College Park. Um, they do not have any particular way for youth to be involved. However, um, they do have uh, a high school student on their education advisory committee, and there is a student on the rec on their rec board. So they do have two. Uh, committees that they allow a youth appointment on. In um, the city of Greenbelt, there is a youth advisory council. Um, it's seven young adult members, no older than 21, and two adult members. And then the two young adult, two of the young adult members um, are non-voting liaisons to their uh, recreation committee and their community relations advisory board. Just sharing. And in the city of Bowie, uh, they allow 
a, a slot for a younger member on their education committee, their recreation committee, their environment committee, and community outreach committee. And then as, as the clerk there said, when they graduate from high school or college, then they can become a regular member. So I just thought I'd share what some of the other communities in this area are doing. Those were the only ones you contacted, or were there others? No, I, I contacted everyone in the state, but these were the responses <laughs> I got back. <laughs> and I'm not surprised at these three cities. Um, I heard from them. Councilmember Smith. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think a lot depends on the um, particular youth, um, both their personal and as well as their age. Uh, I think it also depends on the uh, particular committee. Some committees um, are more likely to benefit from the input of youth, and some are more able to use the um, resources that a young person, particularly young person youth, would, would provide. While uh, other committees, um, it's on, you know, it's much less likely that that would be true. So um, I support a continued policy as we have it now of on a case-by-case -case basis. Councilmember Clay. Can I have a lone vote against the uh, youth on the on the committee when we did that vote? I think maybe I was. Don't remember. Hmm. I seem to be getting more and more six to one votes. Um, Not here. No. Um, so I think that we need to find an effective way to engage young people. Um, I just f flat out don't support uh, putting young people on, on like the um, the tree commission or the uh, Colta, the judicial uh, committees, not as voting members anyway. Um, I would support assigning um, slots, youth slots, to committees and actually developing uh, criteria and recruitment and outreach to get folks involved on committees, probably most of the committees that are advisory in nature. Uh, I, would be, I would be fine with that. Um, It, it also brings up the issue of, of having like more than one family member on the same committee too though because I guess I, I I wouldn't want you know kids to sign up just because their parent was on the committee because I don't think then they get such an independent experience out of it and so I guess my preference would be that um, we not have folks from the same household on our committees whether they be young people or, or or married couples so I would support that um, when I was when I was first elected to the City Council I said what I would really like to do is a youth council and I didn't want to do it at the time because I wasn't sure I would like being a council member if people would like me and reelect me I didn't want to start something with young people and then you know not a chance of getting reelected um, I think maybe it's time to revisit the idea of having an actual youth council um, and I would be interested in putting that together if the other council members supported it and if I could on occasion get some backup for it if you if you would so um, I didn't have to be there all the time but maybe it's something that we could do um, on a Monday night before council like a m late late Monday afternoon probably the dais would already be set up and you know we could do we could do youth council meetings that way um, or maybe it wouldn't be on Monday, but in any case, um, I guess I would like to revisit that as as well. Um, but I, I would, but I, let's just to clarify, I would like to add slots to the existing uh, configuration of committees. Councilmember Schultz, I think that there needs to be an age minimum because if we're going to have youth slots, because I think that the kids that get appointed to these positions ought to be old enough to think for themselves on whatever the issues might be 
that are facing the committee. Um, one of the things that concerned me with the appointment of the 13-year-old to the Nuclear Free Committee was that you know, he was being, and, and, and this is, I'm trying not to make this personal at all, but his, his words to the city council were being kind of encouraged by his dad, and, I'm, and, and on the other hand, I applaud any child of whatever age that has the, 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 the intelligence to even be interested in nuclear issues. And so there, there's no question about that. It's just that I, I'm feeling that a child on a committee with his family member is hardly going to be independent thinking. He's probably, or she, is going to be reflecting the, the uh, ideas uh, of their parent, as would have I at, at the age of 13 or 14 or even older than that. So I, I'm not sure what that age minimum needs to be. Perhaps 15, I think, might be a more reasonable uh, idea, which is an age when kids start to be see themselves as being independent of their parents, even though they aren't. Um, I like the idea of a designating uh, youth slots on certain committees, such as the Recreation Committee would be an obvious example, but other ones. Um, I, I, I don't like the idea of just sort of keeping it the way it is, because I think what the council's faced with is when a, uh, a youngster uh, is proposed here in front of us, it's going to be awfully hard for us to, as a body, to sit here and um, unemotionally kind of say, no, you don't look, no, we've decided that we don't want to appoint you to that. I mean, it's, I just don't want to put the council in that kind of, um, or any, any, any uh, youngster or their parent or caretaker in in, uh, in any in, in that kind of a position. So I think it's a good idea to have a clear-cut minimum age, so that that question does does not need to arise that or that issue. Uh, I'm also in favor of limiting of. of all committees, all of our statutory committees, as opposed to our task forces, to one, no more than one uh, member from any one family or household, however you want to call it, uh, regardless of the age. Um, and I would really like to encourage the th th some thinking on the idea of a committee of, of f for lack of a, of a more thoughtful term, on youth activism and, and just be comprised of young people. Uh, and they can have adults on that committee who would be non-voting. So in other words, you turn the whole situation around, which would be an excellent way for, I mean, you take these, these um, uh, children that we've had come before us in week, recent weeks from Piney Branch Elementary School, and I'm just astounded by how articulate they are uh, and able to sort of stand up and, uh, and just say the things that, that they say. No question that they've had assistance from their, from their parents and or teachers and all of that, but that is all part of the educational process. And I think a committee of youth on youth activism would allow those kinds of kids who are interested in this sort of thing to, to start dipping their toe and their foot into the process of, dem of, of local democracy. And I'd love to be able to encourage that uh, in any way that we could. And I'm not sure that I've got the right name for it, but I think it's a valuable thing. And I'm sure that the parent of any young person on any of these committees would want their kids to, you know, if we had a, a youngster on the nuclear free committee like we have now, I'm sure that parent, those parents are excited about 
the exposure that their child's going to have in learning how a committee works and how it tries to make a difference in, in the things that happen in Tacoma Park. But I think it, it can be encouraged directly by, by making, a, setting up a committee that's about the things that are of interest to young people in the city and allows them to make known their views to us just like every other committee does. So those are just some thoughts. Councilmember Stevens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to prove my earlier point, I agree 100% with uh, Councilmember Clay uh, and all of his, the uh, stipulations that she recommended for youth participation in committees. Uh, and I would also like to volunteer to uh, um, join you in discussing the youth council and, and how that might work. I think it's uh, it's something that's easier to say than it is to do, and so we need to do a lot of planning before moving ahead with that. And I'd like to help you with that. Okay. Councilmember Robinson. Um, I'm I'm not in favor of having uh, kids under 18 on committees as full members. I think 18 is a good uh, cutoff because it's the age of majority. Um, I'm. I'm surprised that Councilmember Clay would say she wants to add slots. I thought that um, that uh, slot machines and gambling were completely out of out of the realm of her uh, her uh, universe. But there she is on record saying she wants to add slots, and I believe that uh, uh, Councilman um, uh, Schultz agreed that he wants slots. So I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. But. Um, um, I think that the, the, what we're after in, in, with, uh, in, in part, in addition to uh, empowering young people, is to uh, perhaps invigorate standing committees. And I think that was my feeling when the 13-year-old stood up and said that he wanted to join his father in the Nuclear Free Committee. And, I, and, I, and I'm fully supportive of the youth, of the young activists who, um, who take an issue stance and a very in a certain way, a narrow stance in order to get traction and get somewhere with uh, with um, problems that they see in, in other decisions that have been made in other bodies. And they could certainly turn that against us, too, if we're not careful. <laughs> um, and so kids under 18, how to work with them. Um, I guess I could see a, some kind of shadow committee that could be informal and would have advisory powers of some sort, but not be very much organized. And likewise, I can see a shadow council. I'm uh, I'm hesitant to fully support a a youth council because um, I'm not sure what what it would do or how it would go about doing it. I'm intrigued. Uh, my words, shadow council, I don't know if, if there's enough of a distinction there to make a difference, but um, I'd certainly like to talk more about it. Um, I was, I was going to try and pull a couple of these together, but Councilmember Clay, if you want to have some more comments first. Um, yeah. So I think I would support. Um, both the idea of having a youth council, but um, also um, maybe a broader group, and maybe the youth council would come out of a of a broader group of young people, with a, whether you call it a youth activism committee. And I, I think one of the things that we should discuss, if we're going to go in that direction, then is um, uh, do we do we bring the issues like what does it mean to be a nuclear free city? Um, what are rec department issues and environmental issues to uh, what is a, sort of a contained youth group or do we get that representation by putting them out on the committees and I think that's an interesting maybe question to look at and might be worth talking to again some other some other people who do that and um, maybe even the, the young people about it um, that was, that was the thought that came up as I was listening to people talk. And I think kids need to be older to participate in um, the, on the committee and the environment and those, for it to be meaningful participation. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like what we probably need to do is 
now that we've got some ideas on the table and some sense of what the issues are to schedule another session on this for some time in the fall after we come back, September, October, um, and mull some of these questions over and maybe uh, some of us can come back with some uh, particular parameters or proposals for what we might want to do. Uh, it sounds like we there's probably general agreement that uh, there there may be some uh, more advisory committees rather than the uh, judicial or those types of things where uh, it might be appropriate to have some uh, slots available. Uh, whether they would be out of the uh, existing number of positions available or whether they would be a dedicated one added. And if that's the route that we want to go, then advertise those. Uh, whether we want to have a youth council or a youth activism committee or both, um, I think there's probably uh, agreement that uh, we want to put a limit of uh, one person per household per committee. and. There's probably there's a sense that we probably want a minimum age, but I'm not sure we know what that number is. Um, maybe just a general sense right now, a little straw poll of uh, sense of minimum age. Nothing anybody's going to be held to, but just it might give us a little more something. Councilmember Robinson said he thought 18. Um, and does anybody want to go younger than 18? Just a nothing anybody's going to be held to. Uh, Councilmember Clay. I, I think I would go sophomore in high school. And I could certainly be talked into freshman in high school. I think freshmen should probably concentrate on matriculating into high school. But I would say once you've been through your freshman year, you know what your expectations are, and you could make a commitment to a committee as a sophomore for areas, for times when we would like, you know, put slots on committees like the rec committee, or, well, the rec committee might be an exception, but like the Committee on the Environment or those other committees. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we had a youth advisory council, I think when you had well, a council, a <laughs> well, and where we had a council of young people, I think we could have, you know, five slots for Piney Branch kids, you know, five slots for middle school kids, and five slots for high school kids, or what, you know, however, we just try to divide it up. And there's, I would go as young as the kids that we see that are coming to us from the Young Activist Club. I probably would not go down to Piper's age in, in the K one two, but. But I think Piney, four, probably fourth and fifth grade and up for a committee of kids. Councilor mm -hmm. Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I think that you know we're talking about two distinctly different things here. The thing that was on the agenda tonight is about appointments to committees, and I again uh, echo my support for Councilmember Clay's recommendations on that. I think uh, as far as age goes, uh, I would support. Uh, lower age than I think anybody else on the council is going to. Uh, I, you know, I've seen the young activists come in here, um, and I think they contribute uh, with their ideas. And I think it's not only the ideas that they bring forth, but I think it's the uh, the spirit that it builds within people and within the young people of this city to include them in these committees. So. Uh, I would open it up to uh, elementary school age children. Uh, but I would like to uh, separate this discussion from the youth council or uh, youth committee, whatever it is, because I think that is a separate issue and it's, a, uh, it's going to require a lot more discussion and time from the city council, uh, time that we can gain by not talking about alcoholic beverages. Thank you. If, if we go that route um, and we come back to something uh, after some more thought about a youth council or a youth activism committee, then we would be identifying uh, the committees that might be appropriate for uh, youth appointments uh, and adding general rules about uh, limited number from a household and a minimum age. So I'm back to the minimum age. I'll throw 15 out there. Yeah. <clears throat> I like this uh, more in high school. And is that 15 or is that? It is about 15, it's yes. It's about 15. 
15 is the age that I thought yeah. I spoke about. Right, right. Uh, right. Uh, just based on my experience with a bunch of kids and grandkids. Uh, going through that age that that's the reaches it's a time when kids start to really do think independently of their parents which is why sometimes they're so darn hard to to, uh, to deal with as a parent because the kids are starting to be able to see that <laughs> mom and dad aren't always right and some of their decisions are arbitrary uh, even though they you know and they have to deal with the, the, the realities of the outside world so I think 15 is probably a good a good age. Mm -hmm. They're just beginning. They're entering into that phase, and when they come out the other end, they can say, "Gee, it's amazing how dumb my parents were when I was 15, and how much they learned by the time I got to be 21." More than 21. <laughs> Did he? Um, so do we want to say uh, that we'll? that uh, staff will identify appropriate committees with input from the council uh, for youth appointments, that there be uh, only one person per household per committee, and that there be a minimum age of 15, and then we'll have a, another discussion about a youth council, youth activism committee. And, and did you talk about how many youth would be on a committee? No. It might it might be different for different committees. It okay. might be one. It might be two, but we could we could kind of put that together, and then there would be some discussion about you know whether that was the right number on the right committees, and go forward with that if that seemed appropriate. So we can come back with some options. Yeah, right. Councilmember Robinson, you have some. I'm I, I'm not sure that no no more than one person from a household would be on a committee. Yeah. Um, but sure that's an option when you bring it back it's all options yeah. to we I mean I can, see, I can see the downside of having a kid feel into the control or what have you of a parent but um, I can also see advantages to having a, a, a couple who are living together or whatever on the same committee from perhaps I can also I can also see a, uh, somebody who's younger and a, and a parent or even a grandparent being on the same committee. So I'm not quite ready to sign on to that. Only one for my house. Well, I'm, I, well okay. Um, so we'll, we'll get options back on that set. That can come back sooner. Mm -hmm. And we'll schedule another discussion about uh, Youth Council Youth Activism. And anybody who has any input on either one of those, circulate it to the rest of us, okay. copy the clerk. If you want to, if you if you want to coordinate the uh, youth, it sounded like you and Councilmember Siemens was willing to help Councilmember. Anybody who wants to, but uh, make uh, Councilmember Clay the uh, lead person, and uh, we'll see if we can get that one back on the agenda uh, sometime this fall, so that if we want to go forward, we can do that uh, during the school year and not get get it wrapped up in budget and everything else. Even though we're going to start talking about budget in September. <laughs> if, if I can yes. also just, as people are thinking about it, recognize that we are lower on staff internally than ever before, and so the amount of assistance that we'd be able to provide is, is more limited. Right. Maybe the uh, young activists can help us. <laughs> well, that's why I said I couldn't do it by myself. I have to be other council members. And I appreciated would have that. To help. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Besides, it should be a council mentorship activity, not a staff mentorship right. activity. Right. That, that, that would be a com committee that the council would probably staff. Yeah. 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 That'd be nice. There's, we're all bobbleheading that one, so yes. That, well, that's, 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 been, that's been decided. The council work on it. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's easy to guess. Yeah. Well, but we're all nodding too. Yeah. So. Uh, and it's not just because we're tired. <laughs> we're adjourned. I thought we were adjourned long ago. <laughs> oh, stop! I was nodding. Long.